I'd like to remind everybody here in the audience that we actually have three different audiences we're trying to please. And that makes me a bit of a hostage to this chair, because what happens is uh, you're all here, and we're thankful for that. We also have an online streaming audience that we're trying to bring into this. And then we record these for future use. So um, it's great that you're here. And uh, we, we love having you, but I also have these other people that I have to keep in mind. So you'll see me sometimes, uh, there's a lot going on. Let's just leave it at that. Um, we're doing this so we can get outreach to the neighbor islands. And um, early December, we went out and did a road show in Kauai, Big Island, Maui. It was great to get out and see those people. And there's a lot of entrepreneurship out there. We saw, met with some really interesting companies, um, and there's a lot going on. So let me just start off by saying uh, welcome and aloha. My name is Rob Hack. I'm on the board of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. That is a nonprofit here based in the foreign trade zone. Um, I'm just a volunteer, like all of the other members of um, we call HPEC. HPEC is one of 58 district export councils, or a DEC, that was set up by the US Commerce Department um, going way back uh, into the 1960s. This particular DEC, um, the Hawaii Pacific Export Council, was established in uh, 1973. And we're here with the express mission to help uh, Hawaii and Pacific Island companies export. Now, we are here today because of a generous grant from SBA. Um, do we have any SBA or SBDC people here? I know there's some. She's texting. Um, we'd like to thank them very much for the grant that comes through DBET. DBET administers the grant, and then we all work together very uh, closely to put on the export training. So DBET, uh, please raise your hand. There's Mark Ritchie in the back. He's going to come up and say a few words. The current chair and vice chair of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council are sitting back there. There's Brenda Foster and Betty Brow, respectively. Number one. Uh, Rob, may I add please. that the uh, Hawaii District Export Council this year was voted the number one district export council in the United States. Right. That's true. Mark, do you want to come up and say a couple words? Um, so we also work in this program with the Patsy Mink Center uh, to help companies that maybe aren't even ready to export, but they need a business plan to get going, and so they need some uh, help with that. So we have quite a few partners that help to put this program together. And I can't ignore uh, giving props to the foreign trade zone here where we are, because this is a beautiful building, beautiful facility, great Wi-Fi, and it allows us to be able to have these wonderful seminars and then reach out to the neighbor islands as well with all the technology that's here. So thank you again to the foreign trade zone. And here's Mark Ritchie from DBET with a few words about the High Step program. Uh, thank you, Rob. Aloha. Um, Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I just wanted to uh, explain a couple things about the High Step program, uh, that it's a program administered by DBED, and it aims to be sort of a comprehensive program aimed at uh, very new companies just thinking about exporting, you know, in the next couple of years, all the way to experienced exporters facing certain export challenges or trying to go into new markets. High Step has basically three components, and this is one of the components, which is the training. And this is HPEC has uh, organizing these sessions, and we have some flyers in the back there for the future sessions. This is kind of the general overview, Export 101. Also, as part of the, the training, we have a business mentoring part of this. And what that is, is that rather than just come into a classroom and receive sort of one-to-many, it's actually one-to-one -one business advising and helping you on your business planning and export planning. Uh, in order to get become a part of that, though, you need to go to the DBED website, which is invest.hawaii.gov, and then submit 
the high step application. And what that application is, it tells us something about yourselves, whether, you know, where, where you're at, if you're currently exporting, what your revenue is, what kind of resources you have, some of your, your challenges and things. After you submit that, we have a business advising program, and we have, GBET has four partner organizations that are involved with that. Number one is HPEC, and HPEC's board and all their resources to, to assist. Another partner is the Small Business Development Center, and that would be Joe Burns and uh, Lori Hiramatsu, and Lori's back there, and feel free to kind of grab their cards today if you want. And then another partner of ours is the Mink Center for Business and Leadership, and Terry Funakoshi is uh, way there in the back, and uh, they've been helping with uh, the business advising. And then our final partner is Innovate Hawaii, and that's Wayne uh, Inoy and Wayne Layugan, and they're particularly tasked with helping companies scale up. I mean, if you're going to start exporting, you're going to be increasing production, how do you go about doing that? And so if you submit, go online, submit that application, you will be getting a call or an email from one of our business advisors to talk to you more one-on-one -on -one and see what resources we can bring to the table to help you develop your export program. There are two other components to the uh, high step program. Uh, one is Hawaii Pavilions, where we take out booth space at a foreign trade show, and then we uh, bring Hawaii companies in, and we sort of subsidize the booth costs and a lot of the organization around that. And then the final component is an individual assistance program where there's a separate application, and that's where you can apply for funding to help defray some of your export development costs, such as trade show booth costs and things like that. And uh, if you go to our website, it's, all this is in a lot more detail. I left my cards in the back if anybody needs to call me about the program and has questions uh, or uh, flag me down sometime uh, this morning. Thank you very much. Back to you, Rob. Thank you, Mark. And thanks again to DBET for all their support for HPEC and the funding that we have to put on these programs. We covered this a lot um, already, but just so you, I, I'm only bringing this up so that you know that we're here and you can call us at any time and get support. This is uh, essentially what we do, Export University, we kick the year off with this event every year and then we have several meetings um, throughout the year that are more specific. This is the schedule for this year. You can find it on our website or the DBET website. Uh, we've had the high step kickoffs already and we're now in Export University uh, right now. <clears throat> Export training. This is our Deck of the Year Award. We won this in Washington, D.C. It's a fantastic event. We're very proud of that. Money that we've gotten over the years, and then some of our activities. Um, again, so where our funding comes from, we're a nonprofit. We, we make no money. We're just here to support you and teach you about exporting. Lots of international networking events. We tend to focus on Japan, but there are other events. Last year we did one just on Canada. Uh, we did one just on Taiwan. This year I'm sure later, it's not scheduled yet, but we will get to one on Japan. We work with the universities, both Scheidler and HPU, for their international business students. We did a lot for APEC when that was here, and we still do uh, work with APEC. This is our website, um, hawaiiexportsupport.com. Please look at that. It's down uh, today uh, because there's a virus there, but it'll be back up soon. These are the things that we've been working on recently. 250 companies have come through the Export University program, not just this class, but uh, lots of other courses that we've done. Lots of students. This is our, our current board. Um, I think 25 people now. We all have to be appointed by the U.S. Uh, Commerce Secretary and have shown that in our careers we have uh, export uh, expertise uh, and able to help and mentor small and medium-sized companies on exporting. Okay, why would you export? This is a big question. This is how we kick off the day. Why export? 
It's easier to export today than it ever has been, okay? It's easier for you to contact Japan. Uh, as I, I, you'll re, I will refer often today to Japan. What, what I really mean is internationally. Just most of the companies that we deal with in Hawaii are most interested in Japan first. It's sort of natural, it's cultural, it's closer, what have you. But generally speaking, when I say Japan, I'm, you could translate that to Brazil, Germany, Canada, Mexico, what have you. But we will refer a lot to Japan because I think that that's what most of our companies are looking for. Trade agreements, free trade agreements, you've all heard about that in the news. All of these things relate to trade that is a lot easier today than it was in the past. Demand. Market demand in Asia and other parts of the world is growing, particularly for US goods and particularly for goods from Hawaii. Exporting can be profitable. Note that I said can. We'll come to that later. Competitive advantage. Um, if you're an exporter, it's teaching you things um, that you don't already know about the market. It'll therefore make you a more competitive company against your existing competitors domestically, even just in Hawaii, if you're competing against these companies, but you're, you're selling product overseas and learning things about the global market, that makes you a more effective com competitor at home. And then risk mitigation, certainly, uh, we've seen that in the past where maybe the US co economy is down, but the Japanese economy is up or the European economy is up. It just depends on the global forces at that time. The economic impact of exporting, uh, obviously, it has an enormous impact on Hawaii, has an enormous impact on the country, but particularly in Hawaii, right? We're isolated out here. We need to export in order to grow our job base, grow our incomes. Smaller companies have vast untapped export potential. This is, according, this is a quote directly from the Commerce Secretary. And the Small Business Administration is saying that 30 out of less than 1% of all of the 30 million companies in the United States actually export. Think about that. That's pretty incredible, actually. So there's a lot of opportunities for growth for you. And there's a lot of support from organizations like us, but certainly the government, the, the, the federal government, the state government, all available with lots of programs to help you. And that's part of what the High Step program does. We're trying to educate you on what those programs are. Small and medium-sized companies account for 98% of US exports. That's pretty interesting, right? You would think that it's General Motors or it's Boeing or Google or some enormous company, but it's really the small and medium-sized companies that account for most of the US exports. Now, when I consult to the Hawaii-based companies, I tell them, you have an inherent advantage when you're exporting from Hawaii because you live in Hawaii. The word Hawaii has a great word association or a great feeling in any language around the world. When people hear the word Hawaii, it's a good feeling, a good vibe, if you will. That's not the case for everywhere, right? I, I always use the example in my marketing lectures about Transylvania, okay? That's a real place. When I said the word Transylvania, it went in your ear and something triggered in your brain that wasn't probably extremely positive, right? When you're thinking about exporting from Transylvania, think about the problems those people have just in marketing right away. But for you guys, it's Hawaii, you know. You have to play that up as much as you can. I mean, to the point where it's schmaltzy. You're going too far with it, but made with aloha, made in Hawaii, that has such a tremendous application around the world. The state of Hawaii, our whole life is constantly doing free marketing for you, right? Think about that. Think about these words. Think about Brazil. When you think about Brazil, what does that mean? What does Rio de Janeiro mean? What, is, what does New Orleans mean, right? Those are words and they, they mean something. When you say Hawaii, 
What does that mean? Aloha. What does that mean to not just you, but people in foreign markets? And we have to exploit that daily. All your marketing messages, and we'll cover all this later in the marketing aspect, but you have to really play this up. So exporting from Hawaii, you have an advantage that people in, I don't know, Arkansas don't have, right? Nothing against Arkansas, but when you hear the word Arkansas, do you, what pops into your mind? I don't know. Walmart, Razorbacks, things like that, right? Hawaii, Aloha, Maui, right? Kauai, Oahu, all these words are, are extremely positive in any language, and they all translate very well. It should be no surprise to anyone here that these words translate extremely well into Japanese, or Korean, or Chinese, right? They all translate very well, and the feeling behind those words translates very well as well. You see it all the time. There's 1.6 million visitors from Japan coming through this airport here every year. 1.6 million, right? We have to get on that. And we can export to Japan and other markets as well. Now, I'm building up exporting. That's been my whole career selling things internationally, particularly in Asia. But it's not for everybody. And it's, I'm glad you're here. I want you to learn. I want you to be exposed to exporting what it's all about. But I also want you to leave this meeting thinking, oh, we have some homework to do, right? We have some things to learn. And part of that is why shouldn't you export? And I start off right away with exporting is not for the faint of heart. It's not an easy business, right? I think this is one of the reasons why this year for the High Step program, the, uh, fun, the, the, the threshold of minimum funding was raised uh, by DBET to $200,000 in annual income before you could um, uh, get the funding to do the marketing travel and the trade show travel and whatever. And that's because it makes a lot of sense because you need money in order to export, or you need resources in order to export, right? There are problems and things that you will encounter that you won't encounter sending product from Oahu to Maui or Oahu to uh, California or what have you, okay? So let's make sure we understand that, that once you get into exporting, Yes, uh, these things apply, but you have to be prepared to, to export. Your company has to have some wherewithal and some foundation in order to be ready to export. Um, everything changes. Your marketing changes. We'll cover that later. Logistics is different. Logistics is shipping and all of that stuff. It's different. It's different shipping a product to Japan than it is shipping it to California. Different. Very different. Legal. There's a difference between a Japanese contract with an agent and an agent with that some, somebody might cover your product in the state of Kansas. The contract you have with those two, different, those two agents will be completely different. Could be in a completely different language. Okay, the labor you need to export, the, meaning the expertise you need to export, is different, right? It, do you have somebody in your company right now that can handle a Japanese email that comes in? You know, these are things you need to think about. Currencies: Are you are you able to price your product in Japanese yen? Standards. By standards, I mean. The most obvious one is just dimensions. You have to get out of inches and pounds. They don't know what that is. You tell a customer in Japan, you know, my bicycle is, uh, it weighs six pounds. To them, you might you just speak a different language. They don't know what that means, right? It has to be kilograms, grams, millimeters, centimeters, these types of things. Also, paper size. I cover this a lot later. People have heard me speak, get tired of this, but You've seen on your printer and when you're working in Microsoft Word or whatever 
program you use, that this is a piece of paper. It's letter-sized paper. Right? Everybody knows what that means. If you tell your colleague, hey, print that out letter size, everybody knows what that means. Some people know legal size is actually a little longer. Some people know that. But if you take this piece of paper outside the United States, in many ways it's useless because everybody outside the United States uses a different dimension paper called A4. It's more like a metric standard. So when if you print up all your brochures and you take them to Japan to a trade show and you print them on this eight and a half by 11 size paper, they'll look at it and be polite and that's nice. And then as soon as you're not looking at them, they throw it away because there's no, they can't fit it in their file systems or their file cabinets or their manila folders or anything like that, right? So that's the kind of thing. As an exporter, you need to understand those little things and be able to get to your customer things that they can use and make it easy for them to interact with you. Right? It's a very small thing. Tariffs, taxes, inbound duties inside uh, into a different country. It's much different than sending something to Florida from Hawaii. And then warranties. Obviously, if you warrant a product, a default product, or the customer doesn't like it, I mean, it's very hard to deal with that problem from, you know, you shipped it to Singapore. It's a lot more expensive and more difficult to deal with than if you shipped it to Oregon or the Big Island. What have you. So these are the things you, you need to think about. Now that I've sufficiently rained on your parade, um, what I'd like to say is I, I meet so many companies that come to us uh, in my private consulting world, in my sales world, but also through HPEC. So many of you in here think, I mean, look around. How many are here? 80 people. Look at your neighbor and say, oh, okay, there is an actual, another person here. You're not the first person to try to export, right? Everybody that comes through here, though, seems to feel they're the first person trying to export to Japan, right? You're not. You're, you're not that unique. Your product might be unique, your service might be a little unique, what have you, but you're not the first person that has to cover all of these other topics, right? And my point is that there's a lot of support if you just go out and ask for it and look for it. So don't feel like it's insurmountable, all of these tasks, because there's a lot of people um, who are behind you and can help. HPEC is just one of those, um, but as we'll talk about later, you have the U.S. government and the commercial service can help. You have DBET help. You have, um, depending on your product, you could use the Hawaii State um, agricultural people, very knowledgeable. Um, in fact, we work with a, a couple of people over there who are from Japan. They know the ins and outs of um, sending agricultural products to Japan. They, they've forgotten more than most people would ever know about that. So please don't feel like you're the only ones that are doing this and, 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 and look for help. It's available. Any questions before we move on to more substantive Discussion. Okay. We have a bunch of different um, lectures, if you will. So please try to save your questions to the end of each lecture. Next up is um, export financing. Are you available? Thank you. This is Naomi Masuno. She's a vice president at the Bank of Hawaii. Um, she's been on the Hawaii Pacific Export Council board for many years in various roles, and we're very thankful to have her. Whenever we need somebody to talk about export financing, we always call her, and she's very generous with her time. So she's here to talk about topics that are of money interest to exporters, which is different right um, it's it's uh, banks will consider your project internationally different if you're going to get a loan they 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 like it but again you have to prove that you have the wherewithal uh, financially and internally to follow through with your plans right and Naomi can present uh, a lot of details about that so thank you thank you all for coming here it you know when Rob talks about um, 
resources and people who can help you, there are a lot of people, but you gotta look at the right places. Just when, you, like when you shop, you don't go to any old show, store, you're gonna look for the store that has what you want. Okay, so same here. You're gonna look for people who know what you're talking about, who can help you with um, your, your situation, your product, your country, there are specialists. So I hope you all got this um, SBA guide. Okay, in this guide, this is from SBA, they've got a lot of really great information, information about their loan products, how to apply for a loan, who the lenders are. So if you look on page 2425, here they're talking about um, U.S. Export Center, about the export loans, how to qualify, what the loans are all about, uh, the programs they have, and in the back, they have a list of all of the lenders. So you need to find a lender, not only for um, your banking, but if you're going to look for a loan, you want to know who the actual business banker or the commercial banker is that's going to be able to understand what you're talking about and can help you. Um, you're going to want to talk to the person at the branch who knows how to do a letter of credit or how to do a wire transfer. So you're looking for these specific people that can help you. So before you go jump in and you've got to send money right now, go do your homework and find out who it is that you need to speak to. And so even with um, exporting, there's a lot of homework to do, right Rob? You know, doing a business plan and putting all of the components in there, you've got to do research. Because when you go to the bank with your business plan and it's got like pie in the sky numbers, they're gonna ask you, well, how did you come up with this? And your research is gonna tell you, well, these numbers are correct. My plan is solid. I've talked to Rob, I've talked to John, I've talked to a lot of people about how this is gonna work for you. And this is what's gonna make you successful. So you've got uh, the idea, you did your research, you might have a product Okay, where does your product sell? Where can you sell it? And maybe you are gonna be the first in the market. It's possible. You know, Rob said you're not the first, but you might be. You might make those millions of dollars. So, you know, if you have that really great idea, maybe you don't wanna share it too much because um, if you're getting a patent or um, getting your um, plans in place, you don't want someone to jump the gun and, and beat you to it, right? So, you have the product. You did your research, you know where it's gonna sell, okay? So now you have to figure out, okay, who's my market? Who am I gonna sell it to? How am I gonna price it? How am I gonna get it over there? And then what? You wanna get your money, right? Because you're not doing this for fun, are you? <laughs> well, maybe you are. And you have a lot of money in your pocket. You're gonna just help people in the world with your product. But usually, people are here because they wanna make money, right? Okay, so how are you gonna get that money back? And that's what I'm gonna talk about. How are you gonna get that money back? And if you need a loan, you know, what are the resources that are out there? Okay, so in determining your cost, okay, there are so many things that go into your cost. You know, Rob talked about shipping and insurance. Um, all the things that you think about domestically, how you sell things, there are much more that you need to add into your price in order to get your price <coughs> Correct. So you're gonna add the packaging. You know, sometimes the color, the way that it's, uh, the size of it is really important to where you're selling it, right? Um, so you're gonna do your marketing. You might have an agent, you might have a distributor. How much are they gonna charge? What are they telling you on um, what's best for you in getting your product sold? Translation fees, legal fees, um, you know, selling, Ice cream to Japan, you think it's so easy, you can just sell your product because they like it. There, it's not the same. You need to find out, you know, what are the Japanese people um, allergic to or they don't want to see on the label, uh, what color, what uh, flavors don't they like. And so this is your research that you need to do. What are the bank fees that are involved when you do a wire transfer? Sometimes it's not instant that you go to the bank and they send the money over. Sometimes it's gotta to go to New York and you know, other places, and these people in between might charge you fees. Um, to do a letter of credit, there are fees. To do um, a charge card transaction, there are fees. So researching to find out what all these fees are is really important. How are you gonna get your um, product there? There's insurance. Um, so if you price it your cost 
and say, okay, this is my cost, you add on the insurance and shipping, then maybe it's less risky because you know that at least part of it is covered and the rest of it that may vary will be added to the price. So getting that amount, that pricing is really important because if you don't have, know what your pricing is, you, you might not have a sound plan where you're gonna make money, okay? So now you, you kind of figured out how you're gonna price it, you're gonna make money, you did your budget, um, now, how are you going to get your money? How are you going to pay people? So if you're doing a trade show and the, you're in Japan and they want money first because they're going to reserve a space for you, um, they may tell you, okay, send the money by wire, send it by PayPal, give me a credit card, you know, whatever they're going to um, uh, tell you, you follow their instructions exactly. Okay, and this PowerPoint, I believe, is going to be emailed, Rob? Yeah, we can. Yeah. If so, anybody wants copies of any of these presentations, just let me know. Okay, so they're available, so you don't uh, need to take you know, pictures. Just think about when, what we're saying and maybe some questions that may come up, because this is the time to ask those questions when you've got a lot of people in the room that can help you with that. Okay, so when you go to the bank, you want to find that person who can help you. So if you're doing really simple things, your products are... Um, um, you know, under $1,000, then it's kind of easy to get your money or to send money. You can do it by credit card. You can do it by PayPal. So just remember that whatever you use, that method that you use may have some fees. So for instance, if you're using PayPal, and PayPal has been really progressive in offering a lot of um, services, like um, you can do credit cards through PayPal, you can get um, cash in hand or money delivered, uh, money on your phone, uh, money to your bank account. Uh, there's a lot of ways. And they also have um, financing programs. So they know how much money you're getting in, so maybe they make a loan to you. So PayPal has been really progressive. But whatever method you choose, you need to make sure that you're protecting your assets. Okay, so as easy as Rob says it is, it's also easy for those hackers, those scammers, those bad people in China or Nigeria or wherever they're from, they're, they can get into your email. So if you're sending confidential inf information, it's not on a secured email, then be careful. So we had a situation where um, a buyer and a seller sending emails and they have their um, information or send the wire transfer to this coordinate. So the bank gets another email and it looks exactly like our customer's email address. And it says, oh, you know, change in plans. Instead of sending this money to this account number, send it to this other account number, okay? And luckily, it wasn't a clerk that was just following instructions, it was somebody who knew the customer and said, hey, did you send this email, okay? And it wasn't that person. So have you folks ever gotten those emails and it's from your friend, their email address, and it says, I'm stuck in, in um, UK, send me $1,000 because I lost my passport or whatever. Have you ever gotten those? It looks like the guy really sent it to you, yeah? <laughs> so you gotta be really careful with these emails and be careful that your email address with all of your contacts don't get compromised because if you've ever had people call you up, hey, did you send me this email? Uh, somebody got into your email box and sent an email out to all of your contacts. It happens. These people out there are so smart. They can get into your bank accounts. We've seen PayPal uh, amounts, $50, $49, it's a debit. And so the bookkeeper person thought, oh, my, my boss bought something on PayPal. Okay, well, well, somebody who got that account number and started to little by little take money out of that account. Okay, so you gotta watch your account and see what's going on. So having online banking is really good so you can check. Okay, so find out who it is that you need to talk to at the bank. Find out how long it's gonna take you because if you need to get a wire transfer someplace and they need it tomorrow, you might, they might not get it tomorrow. They might not get it in the amount that you want because you didn't send it in their currency. You send it in US dollars and they have to convert it. Um, maybe there are people in between intermediary banks that took out $100, $50, and so the person who receives that money isn't gonna get that amount and they're gonna get it in maybe three days instead of tomorrow. So make sure you find out what that um, system is. I need to send, if I'm sending it to US, I need to get it to the bank by nine o'clock. 
okay? Um, so you gotta watch those time, um, timelines, okay? So it's really important to find out who your bankers are. And so if you establish a bank uh, relationship, find out who is the person you should be talking with and try and develop that relationship with that person so they understand what you're doing and they can help you. And they can bring in other resources within the bank to help you. Okay, so it's not everybody at the bank that knows how to help you, so just find the right people. So on the back of the book, there are numbers for all of the banks, so you look at your bank and find out what the number is, call, find out um, who the resources are. Okay, so now you've figured out um, your pricing, your banking, how you're gonna get um, paid, so what are, your good, what are your options that you can give your customer? So if you're selling something that is small, or it's a one-time transaction, usually you can get cash in advance. So who's selling with cash on advance? Pay me first and then I'll sell, sell you something. Okay, so how does that work? It's working for you? Yeah. Okay, but is it competitive? Okay, good, because they want your product, okay? And you have leverage. Okay, but if you've got big items and you've, there, there are a lot of competitors that are out there that are offering terms or um, send it to me and pay me later, then you might not be competitive. Even though they may be a little bit more, um, they may have a competitive edge. So it's that, um, that balance on finding what's gonna work for you. But when you first start off, you don't know who your customer is, you wanna get paid in advance. So when you get paid in advance, there are different ways. There's wire transfers, there's PayPal, um, there's credit card. Uh, there's so many other ways of getting your money in advance. But just be careful on whatever way you're using because credit cards, you might get your approval today and two, three months down the road, you get a debit in your account because your bank says, well, the person who really owns that account number said they didn't make that debt, that charge. That can happen, okay? So you gotta be really careful. You gotta know your customer. So at the bank, that's what we say. You know, your, you need to know your customer, okay? So you get your money right away. You might have to pay 3% for those charge card transactions, but it might be a stolen card, okay? There's so many different ways of stealing card numbers. There's, there's the, the dark web, black web, your, where your, your information is out there. They, they can get it out there. Okay, so cash in advance is really good, but say you're, you have a, good, a really big transaction and the, the buyer wants to make sure that he's gonna get that transact the goods and you wanna make sure you want, you're getting that money. So there are other things that you can have, um, facilities that can guarantee this. So one that was really popular before is a letter of credit. So a, a letter of credit is where the, um, the buyer is going to go to his bank and put money in the bank. So if you need to do a letter of credit, you actually have to put cash on deposit at the bank because the bank has to be ready to send that money out. They wanna make sure they have the money. So that means you've gotta put the money or the buyers need to put the money in the bank and that money is stuck until it's paid. But what the bank does is since they have this money, they're gonna issue this guarantee that says, when you send your documents in, we're gonna send you the money, okay? So be careful on what those conditions are because you wanna make sure that whatever conditions you have on the letter of credit can be met. For instance, on the letter of credit, you're gonna say, um, I need, in order for the bank to pay, I need two copies of the invoice, I need the bill of lading, I need the insurance documents, I need all of these documents in order to prove that the shipment was made. Okay, and then the bank will look at the documents, okay, I can pay now or you know, pay in a few days, but they need to pay when, they, when you're asked for the money. So you can say um, transshipment, so if you're buying things and it's going through different uh, locations, you're saying it's okay to go transshipment, it's okay to do partial shipments. Um, you need to specify all of these things in a letter of credit. So letters of credits were really popular before. We used to have these big departments that had mega people that did these transactions pushing paper, but nowadays it's not that popular. Not, uh, not all of the countries are expecting letters of credit. It used to be in, in Philippines. If you wanted to do a transaction over 25,000, you had to do it with a letter of credit, but not anymore. Okay, so the letter of credit is there. Um, it's, the, it's a good, um, 
a way to do it because it minimizes your risk. You know the person has the money and the person knows that you're going to send the money. But it doesn't guarantee that the quality of the item that you're transferring, so if you're, you're the one who's receiving, you don't know if that um, transfer, the goods are going to be exactly as what you um, are expecting. So just be, uh, be aware that it doesn't guarantee that product. It just guarantees that that shipment was made with those specifications. Okay. Um, if you don't want to go with all of the fees, because there are a lot of fees with letters of credit, you can go with a documentary collection. And all this is, it works like a letter of credit, only the person doesn't really have to put their money down. So there's less risk for the bank. They get the documents, and they, um, they have a check, a draft, and they will pay um, that amount in, uh, on um, receipt of all of the documents. Okay. Then you have an open account. An, an open account and that's the next slide, uh, is where, um, where, where you go to the, the dentist and he bills you and you pay when you get the bill. bill. Okay, so you know who your, your customer, you know the two parties. So when you have a relationship with that buyer and you trust them, you can do that. An open account, they buy, they sell, you sell, and they just pay you when, you, when they get the invoice. Okay, so even with that though, you need to think about, okay, do you want the payment on each invoice? Or are you going to invoice them for the month and give them a statement? And then once they get the statement, they have 30 days to pay. So um, that's, these are, those are the different things that you need to think about when you're billing. And so you gotta make sure your accounting people, your bookkeeper knows how to collect this money. And you wanna make sure that if, you're having, if you have an open account, that you are following for those payments because uh, many times people forget or they're going to drag you out and pay when you bug them for the money um, because that's free money for them. So your accounting has to be really good. You got to talk to your accountant to make sure that your accounting systems are um, the way that you can work it out and that you have the safeguards and the um, double checks to make sure you're getting the money that, that's owed to you. Okay, so whatever method you're going to use, make sure that you know what the exchange rate. So if they're paying you in foreign dollars and they're paying what they think, but when you convert it, it's not what you think, then you, you need to consider what are the exchange rates and what is the conversion. So when you price things, you might want to put in a little cushion, a little reserve in case you have that fluctuation. So you have some buffer there. And then if you um, did good and the exchange rate was favorable for you and you made more money, you might want to send them, you know, free products to, you know, for goodwill. So something to keep that relationship. In, in Hawaii, you, when you go someplace, you bring something, right? Or you take omiyage. There's something to think about when you're developing that relationship with your client is how can you really make that um, client secure or happy with you or really committed and loyal to you? Okay, so exchange rates are really important to watch. You want to make sure that it's not fluctuating a lot because it really will affect your, your pricing and your um, profits. Okay, so now you know how to get the money, um, you got your system, and maybe now you want to go to the next step because you're gonna, somebody's going to order like 20,000 of something. So how are you going to make that? Do you need a loan? Do you need facilities? So there are a lot of options. So work with your banker, find out what you need to do. But if the banker's not that comfortable because it's something strange, something outside of what they um, can see because it's a foreign country, then you might want to bring in the Small Business Administration. The SBA is there to help um, small businesses to support their loans, support their product, and because we need the foreign dollars in the United States, we've got a trade imbalance, right? So it's a good thing you guys are getting those foreign dollars in here. So the government wants to help you. So if you are, your loan package is a little weak because it's a new venture, it's taking a big step and, and they are not comfortable with it. SBA has these products that will give the bank a guarantee. So if the loan doesn't go, somehow something happens um, and we need to charge it off, SBA will cover a part of that loan amount. Okay, so these are the loan products that SBA has and, and it's in the book too, if you wanna read about it. 
But the best thing is to find that banker who knows about the product and who's going to know what's going to work for you. Because maybe it's not an SBA um, ex um, export loan because sometimes there are um, conditions that it has to be for exporting. And so maybe you have a mix of exporting and domestic. So you want a regular line of credit or a loan, not an ex export. So that banker is going to be able to understand what you're talking about and try and get that loan or line that's going to fit you and what you need to do, okay? So a loan is where you get, you know, one lump sum you pay over time, and a line of credit is like a revolving charge card. So you borrow, you pay back, and then it's more flexible. But lines of credits are usually for a short term because um, it needs to fluctuate. So if you borrow on a line of credit and it's, the balance stays up, all the time at 100000 it should have been a loan because you've got to pay it down. So that lender is going to help you understand what kind of product is good for you. So SBA, they have um, rules, and all of the banks who participate have these rules that they need to follow. Okay. So these are eligible uh, eligibility um, criteria. So you have to be small, according to SBA. So you look at your NAICS code, you go to size standard at SBA, and they'll tell you what the code is, or what the size standard is. It could be 100 employees, it could be 17 million in sales. Every NAICS code has a different um, size standard. Okay? So you, but you've got to be small according to SBA standard. And almost everybody in Hawaii is small. Yeah, Rob? Yeah, so don't worry about that. Um, so SBA can help you if you need that help. So you need to be for profit not a nonprofit. Um, you need to be um, registered to do business in Hawaii. Um, you need to do legal things. Not is this a government thing? Yeah. So they don't want to finance anything that's illegal. Okay. Right. Okay. We also need to show that you're able to make the payment. So if you're showing losses, if your projections are showing losses, or you need a whole two years to do research and you're not going to get any money, then the banks are not going to be able to help you. There are other programs you, you might be able to get, but for the bank, the bank needs to show um, that in the paperwork that they were prudent, that they understood that you are, uh, um, it looks like you are able to make those payments. Okay, so if you say, I need six months to get geared up, um, I want no payments or interest only payments, maybe you can get it, but maybe not. The banks usually want to get you to start making payments in like three months. So good character is something that's really important. There, so they don't know really who you are, so they're going to look at your credit score. So if you haven't checked your credit report, you might want to do that first before you get any kind of loan and make sure it's accurate because so many times there, there's stuff on your credit report that shouldn't be there. You know, we've seen some parent had a kid's cell phone charge off, and you know a charge off, even though it's $25, is going to really hurt your score. So you want to make sure that you got um, a clean credit report, okay? And then so you're going to be approved on your plan, um, your credit worthiness, um, that you're able to make the repayments. Okay, so uh, let's see, the next, okay, these are the conditions on the, S the SBA loans, but you can read about it in your book. Um, but you need to be in business for 12 months at least, not necessarily in, in exporting. So it's, it's a loan that kind of shows that you know how to export, that you, know, you have a plan, that this is not a um, guesswork, that you're going to sell stuff and then not get paid and then the loan doesn't get paid back, right? So there are conditions on the loan. There are small ones that are pretty easy, like 250000 500000 line of credit. Those are express loans and pretty easy as long as you have a business plan. But say you need to buy big equipment or buy a new facility because now you need to sanitize things or you need to um, you know, grow your company, then you might need a loan for a couple million dollars for a facility. That's when, where these other um, programs come into play. Okay? But those, the larger you go, the more uh, collateral that the SBA needs and the bank, and the more um, of a stronger business plan is what they're going to need. So if you can start with um, small and get something, some, ex some 
results under your bank, under your belt, to show that you have a market, that you know how to do the business, that you did the research, that's going to what make your, um, your business plan, your loan package, um, be acceptable. Okay? So there are, um, there's the express, there's the working capital, there's the international uh, loan programs. So you can read about it. And also there's XM, oh, did we talk about ineligible? Well, yeah, we it's did. sort of self-explanatory. Yeah. Okay. And then um, the decision is usually by these things. And sometimes they call it different things. But if you think logically about how someone makes a decision for their loan, okay, you're looking at your credit report. You're looking at the, your ability to repay. Your skin in the game, so what is your net worth of your company, or what kind of assets do you have, and what is the condition? So if it's a country that you're dealing with that um, we're not in good favors with, or there's political unrest, that might be a condition that would make your loan ineligible, okay? Because that's a risk that um, um, people might not want to take, okay? So there's another um, entity called the XM Bank. It's the Export Import Bank of the United States. And they have loan programs, usually for big items like planes, jets, but they also have smaller programs. And one is the credit guarantee or the, um, the credit insurance that they have. So say you have um, an invoice and you want to have a guarantee on that invoice. You can buy insurance on that invoice, okay? So for the bank, it's a receivable. So you can say, bank, these are my receivables, but I have this insurance, and so that will give a little bit more comfort to the bank that if something happens under the criteria that you're gonna be able to collect on that um, invoice. So on the um, credit insurance, <coughs> this is information on the Export-Import Bank, and, and the closest one is in California. Okay, so for the credit insurance, it can help you mitigate your risks like um, political risk, like war, ins insurgency, um, uh, what else? Oh, if you can't convert the currency, okay, but it doesn't, it doesn't um, help you if there's a dispute or if there's a non-payment, okay? So it's these unknown factors that it can insure you on. So you go to the XM Bank um, website and you can apply for the insurance coverage at that time. And it's pretty reasonable on their, um, on their premiums, okay? So these are the requirements for XM Bank and you can um, take a look at their website. But on their website, xm.gov, they have this thing called a country limitation schedule. So this is one that you really want to pay attention to because for even an SBA loan, or even if you're not doing an SBA loan, you want to know what the conditions are with, this, with the government list. So if you want to sell to Cuba, uh, you might want to think about how you're going to do that because you're not going to be able to do it through the banks to get paid. Um, so some of the countries are... The usual the, suspect. Yeah. Yep. So this is the government saying you shouldn't do business with these people, so you need to kind of pay attention. Sometimes, though, you need to do business with that country because they're the ones who can pay. They're the ones who need something from you. So you just got to find some way to get that money um, in and out of that country. And also be careful because even though you might have everything set up, they, might, uh, they still might not pay you. Okay, so it's a risk that you take. Okay, so let's go to um, pass the loan package. Okay, the loan package is um, putting all your ideas, your research into your business plan. You ask the banker, what is my, um, what is the procedure? What is the loan application that I have to fill out um, or not fill out? Some banks don't have forms to fill out. Um, but you need to give them your financial statements. And usually it's gonna be three years of your um, tax returns. And then projections. So if you get this loan 
you, you're going to get to the next level. So what is your financial situation, your statements, what are they going to look like? And so this is what your projections are going to look like with your business plan. So you take your business plan, if you have agents, if you have a customer list, uh, if you can show what you've been selling, um, that you've been successful, this is what makes your, your loan package stronger. Okay. So if you need help with the loan packages, um, there are agencies that you can go to. So SCORE is um, at SBA's office. Their um, counselors are no charge. They'll meet you where you want. But you need to tell them what you need to, what kind of information do you need, and they'll look for a counselor that can help you. And if one of their counselors cannot help you, then they have thousands across the, the country that they can email and see if they can help you. There's also um, the SBDC. They're at the Manoa Innovative Center, but they can meet you wherever. Laurie here? Okay, Laurie, SBDC. Um, so they have counselors that um, can help you with uh, your business plans, and they've been very successful in, in finding um, information for you. There's also the, and I'm sorry, I don't have the Mink Center on this. Okay, the Mink Center is at the YWCA, and they have um, sessions there, and you have some counselors too? Okay, so Mink Center, SBDC score, those are no charge, but the Minority Business Development Center, they do um, charge on a sliding scale, okay? So there are people out there, and of course, there's also the U.S. Commercial Service, there's David Day, um, there's a lot of people that you can get information from. So resources on the last page here with um, um, email addresses and do I have your email, uh, website addresses. SBA has this template called Export Business Planner. It's a template. And so you, you can um, look at that um, template and fill out the, um, the schedules, the spreadsheets, and see if that'll help you with um, your business plan. They also have other business plans that, uh, with um, projections, budgeting, um, templates that you can use. SCORE has um, these templates as well. So lots of information on the websites. Okay. Um, you're going to talk about the different websites for commerce and yeah. trade? Later. Yeah. There's so much information out there. You just need to know, know where to go and look. Okay. Thank you, Nomi. Um, question Questions. Please feel free to ask questions. She's, she's going to leave, so now is your chance. Let me take back the microphone so our online audience can hear what you say. Any banking questions too, I can answer. The transactional insurance, is that per transaction or do you have to set it up as a policy? The credit insurance? Transactional insurance. It's tra okay, so um, for the credit insurance, you can do it per it, um, policy or the policy can cover any sales to that um, company. So it, you need to see how you want to do it because if you have sales to certain companies, they can do one policy for that. For transactions that you do um, with letters of credit, for instance, but it's, there's a fee per transaction. If you do PayPal, it's per transaction. Credit cards per transaction. Credit cards are usually about 3%. Um, PayPal is 2.9% plus 30 cents plus they have another fee by country. So you need to see what kind of country the added fees are. So yes, you need to find out if, it's, if there's a transactional fee for your transaction or there's a fee for that company and factor that in. Other questions? Can I add one quick comment of somebody who's had to deal with, uh, not deal with, but had a relationship with banks? A lot. Um, personally, I, we use the Bank of Hawaii, but all, all the banks here can pretty much handle what you need to do, although probably not federal credit unions, right? Don't do a lot of wiring and all of that stuff. But I have found what Naomi said, having a relationship with the bank and a banker, an individual at the bank is extremely helpful. I can't tell you how often that saved me. Uh, for example, when I have to wire money to India and you go to the bank 
and you deal with somebody who knows how to do that really quickly, it makes a complicated process just go by in five minutes or something. Um, but because that person knows you, knows your face, knows your name, it just makes everything so much smoother. And so that banker is really your conduit to the relationship to the whole banking organization and can help you a lot. And so um, I've also found that like anything in life, the good ones get promoted and um, you start to have a relationship with somebody and then all of a sudden they get promoted and you start over again. But that banker usually transitions you to the new person that's replacing them and your information sort of comes along. And so you don't have to be a big wheeler dealer type of person to have a relationship with the bank and the banker. Just go in and explain yourself, explain what you're trying to accomplish, um, where you're trying to go with your business, where you might be exporting to, roughly what things cost, that sort of thing. And just get a conversation flowing so that when you have a question, it's really easy to call or email that person and ask them or just stop in the bank and you know make an appointment and go in. Um, they, they're, the banks here in Hawaii, I think much more so than the mainland, are really based on those relationships, person-to-person -person relationships. And so I highly recommend that you find that person before you really need them. Find them now uh, and get them into your business plan and put in your business plan. This is my banker. This is who I want to use. This is his or her telephone number and email address. And so you have it all there. It's very uh, beneficial to you now. Okay, any other questions before we move on? Okay, thank you so much, it was wonderful. Great. Okay, bear with me one second while I bring up our next presentation will be David Day. We'll be covering legal topics. David, come on up, come on down as the case may be. David Day is um, a longtime member of the board of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. He's also a well-known uh, attorney here locally with lots of experience internationally, uh, particularly um, Asia, Vietnam, Indonesia. You're on the Indonesia-Hawaii Chamber of Commerce, isn't that right? Um, I recently traveled with David to Washington, D.C. to collect that award. We sort of patting ourselves on the back for it. But um, David was also recently elected to the National Steering Committee for the all of the district export councils. So Hawaii is um, very much punching above its weight when it comes to these district export councils and what's going on, especially when you consider, say, like the um, Inland Empire in California. They have something like... Um, 1,300 manufacturing companies just in their little um, district export council that they're um, uh, promoting. And here in Hawaii, we, we um, got the Deck of the Year Award. We have somebody on the steering committee, and we're out here just in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, right? So I, I think it says a lot for Hawaii and where we're able to go with these exports. So David is going to talk about legal topics because, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the conversation towards 9 o'clock, that doing business internationally is much different than doing business in Oregon or Florida or somewhere, and that the legal aspects are not hyper-complicated, but you do need to be aware of what's going on, and you need to have in your toolbox professionals like David that you can call on to work on your contracts and for advice and what have you. So um, we're always very thankful when David's here to give a presentation. So please welcome David Day. All right. Well, good morning. Um, <clears throat> it's a nice position to be in, uh, I guess, kind of in the middle of the morning because that way the caffeine is taken hold and I'm not the person blocking you from getting to lunch. Um, <laughs> Um, and so just a quick warning, um, uh, you know, a lot of people get terrified in a conference whenever a lawyer comes to speak, you know, they head for the door. And, um, and so my warning to you is that uh, this is not going to be a strictly legal presentation. In fact, you'll have to look hard to see the law in this um, because uh, 
doing business and, and taking care of the legal things really has to do a lot with the framework or attitude that you've got to have. Um, and so there's a lot of practical business tips, uh, or there are a lot of practical business tips that I'm going to mix in here. And um, yes, you're going to need some special agreements. You're going to need some contracts down the road. There are some problems with uh, the drafting of MOUs, which you'll run into. Uh, You'll need, you may have to do a joint venture agreement, uh, hopefully not, but you might have to, or distributorship agreements, contract for the sale of goods. Um, anytime you have a deal that's going to cross an international border, whether you're selling uh, goods or services, there's some real um, uh, heads up things you got to watch out for. So I want to cover some of that. But in terms of the, um, the other things that are coming down the road uh, on some of our our advanced programs will likely be talking about, um, not today, but I just want to give you a heads up, is uh, uh, I am watching very carefully the development of the various sanctions regimes that are being uh, promulgated by not only the United Nations, but by uh, Washington, uh, having to do with both North Korea and I think we'll see uh, some, some further ones coming out on Iran. And those sanctions regimes, as they tighten down, uh, may affect your business. And so for some of our more advanced programs, uh, uh, we'll address that. And uh, always remember that there is the North Korea that exists inside its, its terrestrial borders. And then there is the global North Korea that's involved in all kinds of businesses all over the world that you know, we may not know about, including the little innocent restaurant operation in Lima, Peru. But we won't go there today, just, just a heads up. So um, as a part of the framework, um, uh, let's start with the concept of the business deal that we operate in here in the United States and how that's different maybe. And so um, our view of a business deal is this. Uh, you have two parties together, and what they're going to do is they're going to um, build a relationship um, that's driven by law. And so what happens is that the deal is really driven by trying to get a contract. And, and, and you, if, you, if you recall, there are people that you've heard said, you know, I went to um, someplace, I went to Seoul, and um, um, I, I, I was there three days and I got a contract. Hallelujah. You know, that's like the end of the game. And so the, the American mentality is that the contract is the be all and the end all. That's the goal. And the reason that we have this attitude in the United States, or the liberty to have this attitude in the United States, is because we have a very strong rule of law. If you can imagine, in the 19th century, you have a business person in San Francisco and another business person in Boston. They don't have the luxury of having dinner together. The way they communicate is with the Pony Express or the ship that goes around the horn. So as our country developed, um, we developed a rule of law that actually is like if you could picture a big safety net under that drawing. That if something goes wrong in a business deal, we have the rule of law to catch you or it, the problem. Um, that's a very different situation. And I want you to imagine. Um, if, if we could take, and of course, this is a business deal where in the yellow there, this is the part that you all know, right? This is the part that everybody's scared of. What is that? That's the 42-page contract with um, the series of appendices to it. And, um, and, and the reason that we can do this in the United States is because we have this safety net, the rule of law, uh, and to build this in. Now, this picture that I'm showing you um, is the reality of the way that the American legal system has developed. That's the way that, that um, American lawyers and business people, that's the way that we think. And it's um, to get to this drawing, it's almost, if you could imagine, a business deal like a California roll in a sushi restaurant, right? And so when you slice it with a nice sharp knife and you look at the end, you can see all the pieces in it, right? You're awake, right? <laughs> All right, OK. Now, imagine if we took the same California roll, um, but instead of being the, the American or the US business deal, 
we took the Asian business deal and we slice it open with a really sharp sushi knife. What does it look like? Well, it looks like this. Um, you got your two parties, same, same, but slightly different. Um, and so what happens is that you have a business deal that's put together not based on a contract, but what? It's based on a relationship. And that is a different ball game, ladies and gentlemen, than, than the American attitude. And so some of our deals here in Hawaii have this Asian flavor, and there's a bit of a relationship. And you just saw Rob stand up here and talk about the importance of having a what? A relationship with a banker, OK? Um, and so what happens is uh, in order to, to uh, to do the deal, the first thing that's going to happen is that there's going to be some type of business bonding. That's an inter the entertainment factor, the, the getting to know you. There's a song there that I don't do very well, but you can work on it later. Um, and, and what happens then over time is that you get some gifts and some favors exchanged. Some of those are OK. Some of those um, have their big, ugly foot in the bucket of corruption. And we'll talk about the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and some corruption challenges, bribery things that you may run into down the road in one of our more advanced programs and how to handle that. So the concept here is to get to, in the upper left corner there, a trust-based relationship, a relationship that's based on trust. Why is this? Well, the answer is, in most countries, in our region of the world with, I think, the single exception of maybe Singapore, there's not much in the way of a legal infrastructure to catch you. So you got to rely on the personal relationship. And, and so one of the things to watch out for in this, this arena, if you will, as you begin to think about export, and it, it's not only in, in the Asia Pacific region, but other countries in the world, is that our attitude in the United States is that, OK, OK, we're going to do this MOU thing, Memorandum of Understanding. And that's like a baby contract. It's not enforceable. That's our attitude. It's a step in the right direction. So we sign off on this MOU. Well, watch out for this, particularly in China and some other countries, because they treat an MOU as a contract. So you have to be very careful of the wording of that so that you don't accidentally get yourself lashed into a situation where the courts of a foreign country will have their hooks into you. Watch out for the MOU. All right, so let's try the next thing here that's important. Um, and that is the whole crux of where business is done, how it's really done. And um, before you hit this video, let me just show you this one, talk to you about this one little piece you're going to hear here. This video clip was shot by a a uh, former executive MBA student of mine in Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam. This is in the lobby of the Majestic Hotel. And this was a hotshot team that came from Silicon Valley, from Intel. And they're negotiating, or did negotiate, the um, investment in Vietnam of a $1 billion chip manufacturing plant. And the part that I want you to notice here in this is if what I'm telling you is so important, see if you can decide for yourself when you watch this video how well was this team, this sophisticated Silicon Valley cutting edge team, how well prepared were they when they were really put to the relationship test here? So check this out. Paying attention? What are you noticing? Nice 
That's the CEO, the lady, the blonde lady. Okay. You go to this export development seminar at the foreign trade zone, and then in the middle of the morning, when everybody's pretty awake, you have this lawyer who's talking about the legal side of doing business deals and, and things you need to be concerned about in developing an export plan and so forth like that. Um, so you're prepared for this. And then this chap comes up and shows you this video of these guys drinking in a hotel lobby and some of the worst karaoke that you've ever heard in your life. What do you suppose is the point here? Yeah, I, okay, I admit they um, pretty lousy singers. Here's the point. This is where the relationship building starts, this type of entertainment. And you had better be prepared, otherwise you look like absolute idiots. And you notice the Vietnamese knew the words and the Americans didn't to the John Denver song? I mean, give me a break. Did you notice that the Vietnamese could sing and the Americans could not? Give me a break. So in the past, I've, I've taught executive MBA classes on, on opening new markets and so forth. So one of my assignments always was, OK, next week, you come to class. Happy birthday doesn't count. And you can't do Christmas carols. But you are going to come up to the front of the classroom, and you're going to sing a full song with no notes and no accompaniment. Everybody did it, scared them to death, and they loved me for it afterwards because they said that's exactly the test they were put to in, in Tokyo or Seoul or you know, Taipei, wherever. And so the point here is that the business bonding, the entertainment side of things, is, um, is really important. OK, let's go to the next piece here. Um, and, and so you'll see other kinds of, of uh, wonderful entertainment um, with food, with coffees, with drinks, and so forth. And um, uh, my tip to you, get good at this. Get good at it. Um, and so you enjoy your foods. The other thing is that you know, when you're dealing cross-border, there are always problems. You know, there's English, and then there's English, and then there's people who speak English who don't speak English, and you don't speak maybe their language. Um, so, you know, it, it can be a cultural mess. And so uh, I, I think this, this video captures that. Um, and you'll notice that there's translation work being done, but there are translators, and then there are translators. Um, OK. Is that everything? I mean, 
So you get it. He, he clearly has no idea what he's supposed to do. There's a translator there, and it's, it's just it's not working. OK, let's see what we have next. The concept of um, what a business negotiation is really like. Um, and I like to use the, the metaphor of, uh, of an iceberg. And so you know the, the, what's the most dangerous part about an iceberg? Yeah, what you cannot see, right? So what happens is you'll, you'll, you'll have these the stuff that floats above the surface that you'll see, the, the positions, uh, what they say, and then the true interests, what they really want, are down below the surface. And you have to dig that out. And that's part of the negotiating skill, the business intelligence. And one of the ways you do that is ask open questions. Get them to, get them to talk so you can listen, because you've got to find out what it is they really want so that you can match that. And on, above the surface, there'll be this, you know, just like we do in real estate, the DROA counter and offers and counter offers back and forth. And you see those, but you've got to keep digging beneath the surface to find um, some of the, the, the issues that are involved here. And uh, Rob will just move through those, but, you know, all kinds of interesting things in different countries where there's different cultural relationships or body language. Um, uh, and way down there at the bottom, notice I've got corruption and favors shows up there, too. Uh, you have to watch for that. Now, uh, we come to the concept of mental framework. Um, before we go on here, um, don't, don't, don't touch it, Rob. Just hold one second here. Let me ask you, where, some of you got some uh, travels here. Um, this is the most famous bridge in the Asia Pacific region in terms of international business. Betty Brow, you be quiet. Where is this bridge? It's the most famous one in the entire region. No. Partial credit. What do you think? Any guesses? Hong Kong. Who else? Vietnam. OK, good. Who said that? Extra donut for this guy, OK. Um, um, it is. That's in, um, in central Vietnam. And the reason it's the most famous bridge is that during the 16th century, understand, this is a Japanese wooden bridge that has survived, built in the 16th, early 16th century. And this bridge in a, a, a town called Hoi An links the, in those days, the Chinese trading community with the Japanese trading community. And so the reason that we have, okay, so, so Rob, we'll hit the next click there on that one. And so if you go to Hoi An today, on either side of the, the, the bridge, the architecture uh, of, of these ancient trading towns is pretty well preserved. Now, here's the, here's the important part. The reason that I have this bridge is this is a piece, a way of trying to communicate to you by pictures the mental attitude that you're going to need to be successful doing international deals. And the concept is you be the bridge. You be the bridge, meaning that you may be standing on your side of the bridge from a Hawaii or an American perspective, and you're looking across, and let's say you're dealing with someone from Taiwan. 
and you realize that you got to make that linkage. So mentally, even though you are an American, you're standing on the American side of the bridge, mentally what has to happen is you've got to be able to run over to the other side of the bridge, turn around, and look at the problem, the issue, the negotiations from their perspective. If, if you catch what I'm trying to teach you this morning with this, this is very powerful and extremely useful because then you, you can help interpret to explain and, and if you understand their perspective, it'll help you make bigger and better deals for everyone's benefit. And you, you then get into a situation, a real win-win style of negotiations because you can see it from their side. I think it, it, it always helps to be able to walk in another person's shoes. It really does, if you can. All right, let's go on here. Um, now, the concept of intellectual property is this. Um, yes, there are different types of property having to do with patents and trademarks and copyrights, and we get into this a lot more in, the, in, in a more advanced programs. But here's the piece that, um, that I want to communicate with you that's very important. Um, most business people, when they set up a business, they're focused on the business. And they don't catch the concept that intellectual property is another asset. It's called property. 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 Meaning, you can develop something else of value for your business while you're developing your business. Now, let me give you a really good example of this. How many of you have heard of um, this fabulous Hawaii entrepreneur, Famous Amos? Famous Amos chocolate chip cookies, Famous Amos chip cookies, Famous Amos cookies without the chips. Okay, so Amos is a master at developing intellectual property. And what, he, and what, is, he, what is his product? It's cookies, right? He's making and selling cookies. But if you look back over his business history for the last 40 or 50 years, he's sold one of his intellectual property names, his trade name or trademark, again and again and again. So um, I had a meeting, um, um, my partner Elizabeth Chan, Dr. Chan is here in the front row here. We had a meeting with a client of ours uh, in, in our offices um, earlier this fall. And um, the, the business people were sharp. They had big business, good cash flow, but they didn't understand the business concept of intellectual property. They look at this as a series of registrations, which it is. It's a series of registrations, and there are different requirements for different types of, of intellectual property. And so what I did was I pointed them out the window. I said, see that condominium building over there? You have the opportunity, I told them, and I'm telling you here, you have the opportunity while you're building business here to build this magnificent condominium tower just like famous Amos did. And at some point down the road, it has value and you can, if you choose, sell off the intellectual property or license it to someone else. And, and, and I want all of you to know, this was like a giant light bulb going on in these folks' head, right Elizabeth? Yeah. I mean, it was unbelievable, it was like, Aha! And they have all of this valuable intellectual property that to them was just a series of registrations and so forth. No, 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 no. It's property. And that's why in a very beginning program like this for the development of your, your exports or your business, we want you to think about developing your intellectual property because it's a side, if, let me call it a side asset, okay? It has value to you. And you might decide to go on in your career making cookies. But if you can sell 
one piece of your intellectual property and make several million dollars and continue making cookies, change the recipe, why not? Why not? So the patent is typically you know, a, a, an invention, um, uh, you know, the corn husker, that type of stuff. Um, and a trademark, uh, a, a good way to, to think of the trademark is if you have the, the Coca-Cola trademark that has the, the, the particular script writing. Um, and if you have uh, copyrights, you know, software, things, or writings and things like that. So um, what's next here? OK, here's the key part as you go out of here. Um, you you want to stay out of the foreign courts. And the way, the way that you do that in any type of contract is you make sure that you've got an arbitration clause that is drafted by somebody who knows what they're doing uh, in terms of legal expertise. And the reason for this is that uh, over the years, there is a uh, United Nations, um, essentially a treaty uh, called the 1958 New York Convention. And that convention provides that countries who sign on board to this will reciprocally enforce each other's arbitration awards. They won't do this for court judgments, but they will for arbitration awards. Um, and then the concept of mediation, um, we encourage this. Uh, this is where you have a third party neutral that comes in and tries to put the smash deal back together again. Different countries do this differently, but it is a concept that works in a lot of, a lot of situations and helps preserve the relationship. Um, and just to kind of wind up this, this uh, talk this morning, uh, I think it's important that you know that that there are some just some common sense, practical things. Uh, and, and if you use common sense, don't leave it in a locker at the airport when you go, um, you'll be a lot better off. And, and these, watch out for some of these things that, that you've got. Do, do, do ask questions. Do do your due diligence. Do, do check out uh, whom you're dealing with in a foreign country. And a really slick way to do this if you're going into a market you've never been into before, is to utilize the services of the US Commercial Service and understand that in most, or every embassy and most of our consulates around the world, there is a US commercial officer. Um, and I use them frequently. Uh, and so typically they have four nationals on their staff and they're divided up by industry sector. And so that the US Commercial Service, they know who are the reputable people to deal with and who are the not so, not so reputable people to deal with. And, um, and, and they can help you in the whole concept. Uh, what I like to call is the, the, the greatest secret of the United States government <laughs> is the US Commercial Service because they, they are very effective marriage brokers. Uh, to help you find a really good, reputable, um, let's say, a distributor or potential partner in a foreign country. Um, but obviously, it's up to you to make the selection, and, and they'll provide a whole list of opportunities or individuals that you can, you can meet with, go check out their operations. But I'm going to end this right now and take some questions, because I find that um, this is enough to uh, uh, tease some intellects. So let's have it. By the way, one qualification. If I hear from the question something that sounds like you're looking for particularized legal advice, um, I'll try to do one of these answers where you don't get an answer. You know, it's called the dance of the Goonie Birds. So if, it, if it's something like that, that I, I, I really think that you need to consult your own legal counsel, it needs to be done privately. Um, you may not get the answer that you're looking for from me. doesn't mean I don't know the answer to the question. It just means that that's not an appropriate question to ask here. So in the back. The U.S. Commercial Service, is it only overseas, or do they have an office across the street at the federal building? No, actually, they have an office in this building. Uh, and um, their office is in the older section of this building. And we have a fabulous 
U.S. Commercial Service officer that was just in the yeah, room. He was just here. He was just in the room a minute ago, uh, Mr. John Holman. And, um, and the type of assistance that I'm talking about, um, John will go to bat for you. I've had him set up telephone conferences with uh, his colleagues in, uh, in different countries, and then they do a handoff back and forth. So it's right here in the older section of this building. If you, as you're going down towards the, um, uh, the uh, passenger terminal, there's a little parking area there, and he's up on the second floor of that. And, and Mr. Holman may be back in the room here before you even break for later on this morning. So excellent question. Thank you, sir. Questions, please? Come on, this presentation was not that intimidating. Jeez. Yeah. We've had a bad experience in the past with what you said before about the relationship-driven kind of um, business plans. <coughs> and it sounds like we may have pushed to try and get a contract too early, and it just made the whole deal kind of go south. And what country was that in? Japan. In Japan. Yeah. Oh. How, do you, how do you know when it is the right time to get to that contract phase? And, or how long do you normally have to take in that entertainment and the hanging out or just talking about not work things? Well, there's a specific formula. And what you do is you multiply the number of days times the hotel rate and divide it by the number of restaurant. No, there's no <laughs> formula for that, OK? I, you know, it's, it's a matter of um, intuitive feel. And um, you have to appreciate that in some of the Asian countries, particularly in Japan, they, they are masters of this entertainment. And um, it, it, may, it may be exhausting for you because they'll do handoffs for teams and, you know, somebody's going to take you to the Imperial Palace for the entire day and then there's another group that's going to take you to the, the uh, French kitchen at the Hyatt in Rapongi. and then when you finish dinner there, there's going to be drinks at some restaurant in Ginza and, the, and it has a particular type of sashimi and then early in the morning you're going to get up and they, they have a tour of Mount Fuji and it's like, <laughs> you know. And so there is some real skill in doing this and I think that you just, honestly, you just have to enjoy the ride and, and you'll know. You'll know. Keep your eyes open yeah. and just be open-minded and go with it. Um, but I don't think that there's a recipe for when you know to actually say, okay, it's contract time. Because think about this. They have a perception about you, too. And they're thinking, oh, here's this guy from Hawaii, another American. At some point, he wants a contract. And they need a contract, too, at some point, right? So they're trying to think, well, what's he want? What do you want? And so at some point, you just need to say, well, I think we, we need to, we're at the point now we need a contract. What do you think? Make your questions kind of open-ended and get feedback from them. I think that's the best way. Lots of open-ended questions. You know, what if? What do you think? I think we're ready, right? And that's where you get. If you have a relationship, by that point, you won't offend them. But if you just walk in the first day, hey, oh, you shouldn't shake. You know, bow. Hey, how are you? You ready to sign a contract? OK, that might offend them the first day, right? But after you get to know them a while. If you have a relationship, not much will offend them because out on those drinking parties, you'll you'll see lots of things that should be offensive, right? But if you get to know each other for a while, that's the whole point, right? They they're trying to feel you out. See, so is this somebody I want to work with for the next several years? Would you agree? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, we have some more questions. Questions? Okay. You you have this is from Outer Islands. This is from Maui. From Maui. Okay. In case there is a legal dispute in a cross-border business transaction, what is the biggest legal leverage a business would have in resolving the dispute? Money. Money. Because legal disputes, if it's a serious one, are very expensive to resolve. And that's why, um, well, one of the reasons that we have this, we, we, we made the reference here to mediation. 
And that's, that's a way that you can get in and, and uh, get some money as a respected neutral to help the parties negotiate a new deal. You know, I call it putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. And that takes some real skill, and it's, it varies from, from um, place to place. I'll give you an example. When um, the uh, complex across the street called Restaurant Row was constructed, there was a, a, a series of um, uh, construction defects alleged, um, and the, the parties involved were Hawaiian Dredging and um, Bruce Stark. And so uh, I was asked to be the, the mediator for that. And rather than do the, the discussions and the mediation um, in a conference room in my law office, um, we actually resolved and worked out and got the problems all fixed, I kid you not, at a series of luncheons between the three of us at the Bali Room at the Hilton Hawaiian Village. And that's a very Asian style of resolving a dispute. Uh, and in Japan, it's very common to have a, a tea discussion with a respected uh, business person that gets in between and kind of helps folks work it out. In terms of, in terms of the, the leverage question, you know, uh, my answer, Rob, to money was very practical. But the other part of having leverage is to make sure that you've got that arbitration clause because if uh, that gives you a lot of leverage to trigger an international arbitration um, and there are some expense involved. It's not as expensive as litigation, but it is. It can be expensive, and um, uh, that that just shows that you've got your ducks in order and you're serious about fixing that dispute. Okay. One more question from Maui. Can David please talk about ballpark figures for cost of trademarks in various countries, including the USA? Um, that's one of those questions where we'll have to talk about privately, but here's what I can tell you. Um, through the World Trade Organization, it's possible to get um, uh, kind of package deals for doing trademarks in a number of countries. So once you have your federal trademark, and the federal trademark um, process, I mean, you have to budget uh, I would say anywhere between $2,500 to $5,000 and maybe, maybe it can be less than that, but you may have some back and forth with the trademark office, and you have to allow for that uh, if it doesn't go through smoothly. But once you have the federal trademark, you can package in some of the other countries um, uh, in, at very reasonable rates, ranging from a few hundred dollars to slightly over a thousand per country, um, and do it all in one big application. Can, on the issue of trademark, can you just give the audience a brief case study of somebody who maybe hasn't done that properly in the past and why it's beneficial to get your trademarking under control? Okay, the, the trademark is, is an identification, a logo creation that is affixed to the product when it moves in interstate commerce first in the United States. And so probably the, um, uh, the one that's you would all appreciate. How many of you in this room have iPhones? Just let me see a show of hands. Outer Islands, I know you got some iPhones over there on Maui, Kauai, and a big island, right? Okay, so here's, a, here's an interesting one. Apple did not get the name, the trade name iPhone registered in China. And they got into a legal dispute with another firm in China that had previously registered the name. And so what happened is that iPhone lost that dispute and ultimately ended up uh, having to pay an enormous amount of money. And it's just because they didn't get it registered. Now, here's the thing. There are a lot of um, trade name, just like there are domain name squatters. As you build your business here in Hawaii and your trade name starts to catch on, just be aware that somebody may look at that and say, hey, I bet you those guys will want to expand into Japan or someplace. I'm going to go grab that name in Japan. And then you end up having to buy it from them or negotiate or can't get it at all. So at, that's why we say get, get your US federal trademark and then as soon as possible, right at that same time if you can, where, where are you initially planning to go with your, 
with your product. And let's get the trademarks internationally that are required so we got you covered. And some people do, you know, they, they register their trade name, they spend a few thousand dollars doing it in many, many countries. So they don't sweat it. I bring that up specifically because I've seen many, many times people, small, tiny companies here get burned on that particular topic in Japan or Korea or somewhere else. Oh, no. So the question is, so do you also recommend that uh, capturing domain names, so if it's, you know, company x.com, it would be like company x.jp, can, can you repeat the question for the yeah the, the the question for those of you on the outer islands was um, whether we recommend that you get um, multiple domain names with xyz dot jp dot com and so forth and so on um, I think that's probably a really good idea to have that um, I just I'm reluctant to say, yeah, do it, because I just don't, in some cases, the cost, depending upon the name, can be prohibitive. So, I mean, that's one of the things you have to apply a little bit of common sense to and see what that looks like. But you have to appreciate that as your business becomes successful, um, there is the legal term that we all learn in the first year of law school in the intellectual property classes. It's called, um, it, it's a verb, it's called to cockroach. Do you all know that? You familiar with that term? And so there are people who would cockroach whatever you got. So you have to be careful, because remember, intellectual property is property, and you're building that separate condominium tower, and so you have to do the things necessary to protect it. I don't want to belabor the point, but I would also add that I've seen this problem develop even when it wasn't necessarily nefarious activity on the other part that let's say you start to develop a relationship with a potential agent and the agent says in let's just pick Japan and the agent in Japan says oh I like these guys I think the relationship is going to go somewhere so I the agent in Japan I'm going to go out and trademark their business in Japan they kind of do it without you knowing it or maybe you know it and you bless them and say okay go ahead but then later, a year, or two, three later, mm -hmm. your relationship with that agent isn't exactly the same. But now all of the paperwork for that trademark is in the agent's name in Japan, and you have nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter that that is your trademark, your product, you put the labeling on the pack. It doesn't matter because they've legally registered that trademark in Japan. So as David said, now you have to buy it back from them. And that's, it's just a hassle, and they can charge you how much did it cost Apple to buy the trademark iPhone in China? It wasn't like five dollars, I can tell you that, right? Somebody made a fortune, generational wealth, just on that activity right there, buying iPhone from China. And so Rob's situation he just described is something that um, we had in South Korea uh, with, with a Hawaii firm that, that had its, its agent did all the registration and, 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 and it was you know, completely benign. They blessed it because uh, the Hawaii group was very small and they didn't want to spend the money. And so they paid for that in tens of thousands of dollars when it came to sell the Hawaii company because they didn't have the Korea piece. So be careful about this. Any other questions? Yes. Well, the question, the question is that the, in, in, in this lady's experience, the international disputes that take place between the United States and, say, Japan, that the, 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 there's a lot of 
money being spent on translation services and expensive lawyers, uh, you know, working back and forth across the international border. Do, do, I, do I have your question correct? Okay. And the answer to that is um, there are American firms uh, that have branch offices in Japan. Um, however, those American firms that have branch offices in Japan are at the, um, the very large, typically the very large American firms, mm -hmm. and they are extremely expensive. So you know, part of your question, yes, there are the offices you know, in Japan. And the same is true with American firms in, in, in most of the countries in the, in the region here. Um, it's just that those law firms that have a branch office, that's a very expensive operation to maintain. And um, the costs for doing that are passed along to the clients in terms of legal fees. And so it actually is um, with, um, even, in, even with Japan, it's less expensive for you to operate with um, a small office in Japan has a Bengoshi that, that is not at those kind of rates. Uh, and then with an American firm that is also maybe uh, a lot less expensive than one of the large law firms. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's convenient, and that's why the large law firms are used by the multinational corporations. You know, if they have a problem in Japan and, and in Ho Chi Minh City, they'll use Baker and McKenzie, and, you know, the, you're not going to get an hourly rate less than $1,000 an hour. It's just not going to happen. So, but, there's a, but that requires an enormous amount of expertise within one business to have lawyers trained in, in both countries, both linguistically as well as on legal education. So I'm sorry to give you a partially negative answer, but it's honest. Anything else? Great. Thank you all very much. I appreciate uh, your attention, and I hope you learned something. Thank you very much. There's still quite a few things to go through, so um, if we could, if we run out of time, I'd like to get a show of hands just to see what everybody's most interested in. Um, we're supposed to cover marketing, logistics, technology and e-commerce, potentially cultural issues if we have time, and then government resources. So can I see a show of hands? Who thinks marketing is important? Who wants to hear about marketing? Uh, who wants to hear about logistics? That's shipping and what have you. Who wants to hear about technology, e-commerce, and that sort of thing? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, OK. And cultural issues, I, that's, it, it's extremely important. But we have, perhaps most important, but we have a whole seminar dedicated to cultural issues. So um, we can, we can, you can see that online. Uh, so maybe that'll get scrubbed, and then um, we'll go over some of the government resources. Um, one other thing I wanted to add, on this issue of trademarking, it's become sort of a pet peeve of mine in the past year or two. So this year, we're having our own very specific seminar on trademarking and in intellectual property. But I can tell you for sure that it's gonna, that seminar will weight very heavily towards trademarking and not necessarily intellectual property like patents and what have you, because the Hawaii companies that I meet are desperately in need of um, trademarking advice. So it's here on this flyer is our schedule events for this year. Um, if you look at April 17th is trademarking. We have some people from uh, DCCA here uh, in Honolulu that are coming, but also somebody, a specialist from the US Patent and Trade Office in Washington, DC is coming specifically to um, talk about that. I apologize, it's a little chilly in here. And if I'm telling you it's chilly, I know it's chilly because normally I don't get cold, but um, I see we've got some ladies in here in, in um, fur coats. <laughs> it's that cold. I know, I know. Um, Let's jump into logistics really quick. And I'm going to, we have a limited amount of time and, and a few presentations to go through. So I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. Jump in and just wave at me if you have um, questions. Try to save your questions to the end. But if there's a key point you want to cover, let's do it. So let, let me start with um, logistics here. 
And then bear with me while I get this online for our um, streaming audience. Okay. Normally we have um, on our board, the HPEC board is uh, a, a member of UPS or um, one of his colleagues will come to do this presentation. However, they're having national sales meetings today and they weren't able to attend. So I'm talking about logistics. And again, this will come from, not from UPS, but from me, somebody who's worked with UPS and FedEx and DHL and freight forwarders and all these people over time. So uh, there's a lot of my personal opinion uh, spread in here, but we'll go through it a little quickly. When people say, what is logistics? What is logistics? Well, I think not long ago, logistics meant shipping, okay? Think of that word again. Um, you're tired of me being specific about words, I'm sure, but I think words mean something. And it's called shipping. Ship, why? Because for most of uh, human history, the, or at least in the past few hundred years, when you're sending something to somebody, you put it on a ship. Right? That still occurs, but probably most of our companies here that we deal with in Hawaii, the smaller companies will ship things by what? Air. Okay. So shipping will just mean sending things to your customers as far as we're concerned. Logistics is getting things to your customers. As I said, uh, 10, 20, 50 years ago, uh, logistics really meant the shipping part of it. Just getting things on a boat, getting them on a truck, getting them on a plane, what have you. But more in the last several years, probably because of the advent of modern, some modern technologies and more air travel and what have you, logistics tends to be considered much more than just the actual shipping or movement of the product, right? Um, uh, logistics now includes such things as packaging and labeling. Um, it could mean the generation of your commercial invoice. Here's a term, Inco terms. You need to learn about that and just Google it or Wikipedia, Inco terms. It's like international commercial terms. And you'll see terms there like X works or FOB means freight on board, lots of different terms that are in INCO terms that you need to come to uh, grips with and understand what, the, what does that mean because there's legal ramification for each of those INCO terms, meaning at your dock, that's the legal term, dock, doesn't mean the dock out here at Pier 2, it means your shipping dock at your facility. When does the uh, risk or the financial responsibility for that product transfer to somebody else. So XWorks generally means from your dock, somebody else has responsibility for it, meaning the customer or the shipper or whatever. FOB, freight on board, is another one. Generally, if you're sending bigger products, machinery, it might be FOB. Freight on board means you're responsible to get it to the ship and on board the ship. Right? Even the ramp going up the ship, if it falls off in the water, that's your responsibility. But once it gets on the ship, that's somebody else's responsibility. So these are all, again, not trying to scare you, these are just terms you need to come to grips with because you might see them on a request from a customer. Like, we'd like to order a thousand pieces of your jewelry, but we, we only uh, order things FOB uh, Honolulu. Right? Or you get it to Osaka, and then we're responsible from the boat to our shop in Osaka. Right? There's lots of little things like that, so get used to that. But this is all part of logistics. Again, it's different than sending product to Oregon, because what might you have to pay if you send something to Japan? Inbound taxes, tariffs, duties, you'll hear them called by all kinds of names, but it's really a tax. You can figure all that out ahead of time, right? It's not a mystery. It might be a mystery if you're sending to some place like Cuba, where the, the tariff might be different on Monday than it is on Tuesday. But most of the places that you're sending product to Japan, it's listed, it's understood. Okay, you're sending uh, a candle made out of a certain kind of wax, 
Okay, there's a duty there. It's, it's very well understood. Clothes, all these things. Same for product coming into the US. It's all listed very clear and you can figure out what duty there is or what duty there isn't. If there's a free trade agreement, that's what the free trade agreement means. There's no, there's no duties like that. So increasingly too, logistics is concerned with e-commerce, payments, collecting payments from the customer, right? There, there's a full service, um, uh, logistics suppliers like FedEx or UPS or DHL, where they can actually collect payment for you. You just go, log on to their website and you tell them, okay, pick up this product, it's ready to go. They'll collect the payment, they do everything. Now, do they do that for free? No. Um, lots of things, don't forget when you're working on the logistics issues, language, paperwork, and culture. Every country is a little bit different. Uh, some countries could be a lot different, like Vietnam. If you're sending something to Vietnam, it's not as straightforward as sending something to Singapore. If you're sending something to China, it's not as straightforward as sending something to Hong Kong. Some countries are considered like free ports. Singapore is one of those. You can, between the US and Singapore, you can send anything pretty much, and it just happens like that. Same thing coming this way. Singaporean company sends something to you, boom, just happens quickly. It's almost like sending it to Kansas City, right? There's other countries that are a little bit different. Japan is maybe a bit more complicated, but um, we have a long history now of trading with Japan and it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, they, they have some language, uh, some special language on their paperwork that they want done, but it's pretty straightforward. I, I stole this slide from UPS just to show you that I think there's a lot going on behind the scenes from when you decide, I'm gonna ship this product until your customer actually gets it in their hands. There's a lot of people, um, fuel, money, uh, behind the scenes that's being consumed uh, in order to make your, your um, shipment done. I stole this from the marketing presentation a little bit um, just because what I talk about in the marketing presentation is that Asia is not a way to say, I'd like to sell in Asia. You can't say that. You have to say, I want to sell in Japan. And more specifically, I want to sell to a specific subset segment of the market in Japan who my product is targeted at. But it's the same here for different inbound duties. You can't just say, I'm shipping it to Asia. You really have to know exactly where you're going. I'm shipping this to Thailand. Uh, it's a, a thousand units. This is what it weighs. This is what it's made out of. This is what you're going to have to tell your shipper. So um, a lot of people get concerned, um, air versus ocean. And I try to spell it out here. Um, pretty clearly, uh, air is what fast. You, you know, you, you, everybody think about your own travel. If you would, if you could travel to Tokyo, would you rather go by air or by ocean? Well, probably go by air. Why would you go by ocean? It's cheaper, but it's going to take a long time, right? You could go down to the Honolulu airport right now, buy a ticket, and go to Tokyo for about $1,000 round trip. Maybe last minute it might cost a little more. You could go down um, to one of the ships and say, hey, I'd like to, you can actually take a ship to uh, Japan. Um, it, it only costs uh, like $150 or something like that. But nobody does it because it's gonna take you, you know, three weeks to get there and you have to bob up and down for three weeks, right? So th that's much the way your freight works. Um, this is typically what we're doing from Hawaii for small companies. It's lighter weight products, um, but your fees will be based on the size and weight of the product, right? That's just sort of common sense, right? If you go to the post office and you say, I'd like to mail this, they measure it or it's the flat rate box. Mm -hmm. I actually use the flat rate boxes a lot to send things to Japan. It's $86, I know that. Um, you can pretty much stuff whatever you want in there and it's gonna cost, it, whether it's it, um, uh, a flat rate box full of lead or a flat rate box full of feathers, it's still gonna cost you $86, right? But um, Ocean is kind of that way. 
that it doesn't matter what it weighs, and it doesn't really matter what the size is, right? They're trying to sell a container size, whether it's 20 foot or 40 foot container. So you'll often hear the term consolidation, and that means that somebody's trying to take a bunch of smaller shipments and consolidate them into one 20 foot or one 40 foot container, and then ship it by ocean. Much, 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 much cheaper, but slower. So. Um, there's many options to contemplate when you're shipping. I say here that you have full service suppliers. These are all household names by this point, but they can do everything for you. Absolutely everything, even package it, right? Think about it. You could go to the UPS store and have them box it up. But they can, if you have a good enough relationship with UPS or FedEx, they'll come and pick it up, take it, box it up, create all the paperwork for you, send it, what have you. Is it cheap? No, but they can do it. And then the next level down from that, I would call a freight forwarder. You'll hear that term a lot as you start shipping things. And this is more like an agent, a shipping agent for you. And at the foreign trade zone here, there's several of those that are based here, not just at the foreign trade zone, there's others around Honolulu. And so um, one of my recommendations for this presentation is that you find a freight forwarder and you also find somebody at a UPS or a FedEx maybe both, or DHL, and then when it comes time to ship things, get your own rates from them, and um, they can, you can negotiate your rates that way. Consolidators are the people I talked about before, that they're going to just try to put a bunch of things together that are going to the same destination. That can be very helpful and very useful. Um, and then, of course, DIY. You could try to do all of this yourself. Schedule, wrap it up, get all your paperwork correct, um, schedule the, the boat, schedule the plane, uh, get it through customs in Japan yourself, uh, find somebody to deliver it from the customs uh, agent to the customer. Um, these are all the steps in the process. You could do that. Uh, it probably doesn't come out to be cheaper for you. It's a lot of work, and you're talking to people um, by email or by telephone in Japan, um, and you should be speaking Japanese to them. They probably won't speak English. And so it's, it's an arduous, costly process. That's why uh, it's not for everybody. And in my opinion, it's, it's for very few people. And so you need to be a little higher up the uh, food chain there when you're trying to ship something. So I think most people, small companies that um, I consult to will be looking at a UPS, FedEx, something like that. And um, again, it, it's a relationship. There's an agent there, um, uh, an account executive or whatever, that will get to know you, get to know your company, get to know your products, get to know where you're normally shipping things, and they'll help you get the best possible rates and, and teach you about the packaging and, and help you with the commercial invoices and all of this stuff. And after, if you do enough business with them, they can get you preferred rates as well. And if you start to have regular business, which is what they're after, right? Uh, monthly, you're able to confirm, okay, we send you know 50 packages to Japan roughly every month, 20 packages. It doesn't really matter in my, in my experience, the, the number, it just ma the regularity of it. And if you do things regularly, you can negotiate much better rates with even UPS or DHL. FedEx. Now, again, I think a lot of companies that I consult to here do not pay enough attention to the logistics. So I really didn't want to skip this presentation. All of these things that we just talked about cost something, and you need to factor this into your pricing for your products. A lot of companies don't think about this until the very end. Okay my widget, my clothes, whatever you're trying to sell, the customer in Japan agreed they're going to buy 10 of them, they cost $100 each, they're going to pay $1,000 and I'm going to ship it. And then when they go down to ship it and they realize, whoa, 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 whoa. this is going to cost me $500 to get this thing to Japan, right? But I'm only getting $1,000, that's what we agreed on. Now I get 
so somewhere I'm only making 500. I wind up losing money on this. I, I see this constantly. So get all of this straightened out ahead of time, right? Find an agent or a person or an account executive at one of those companies we talked about, the big, uh, the big three uh, full-service shipping companies, and meet with them and show them, OK, this is what I sell. This is what I sell. This is what the package looks like. Um, you know, are there special considerations? Like, does it? Are you selling um, candles that could melt? Are you selling chocolate that could melt? These kinds of things. Show them. What, you know, what it, what is this um, product all about? And where are you shipping it to? And then get involved. Get involved early. Say, what would it cost to send this? What's the worst possible case it could cost? to send this to Japan, to send it to Tokyo, send it to Osaka. There could be a, a slight difference, right? Then where else are you going to send, maybe? Maybe we'll send it to Singapore, OK? That's our second target market, Singapore, for example. What it, would it cost me to send one of these to Singapore? What does it cost to send 10? What does it cost to send 100? I think for most of the small companies, that's a, a good enough conversation to have with one of these shipping companies. What's it cost to ship one? What's it cost to ship 10? And what's it cost to ship 100? If you can do that as homework, I think that that's a great start right there and getting a relationship with one of these um, shipping companies. Now, I also say there's no doubt that there's some, some issues with being stuck, not stuck. We're out here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's not as easy to ship some things as it might be in other places. However, there's benefits, too. There's a ship that comes in from um, Yokosuka in Japan, just south of Tokyo, comes here uh, a couple times a week, drops a lot of stuff off, and then goes back pretty much empty. Right. So if you're in the ability to ship things by ocean, there's a great opportunity right there because that those, that shipping line is looking for customers and any money that they get uh, going back to Japan is better than nothing as far as they're concerned. Nobody wants to send back an empty ship, right? So the rates to send things by ocean uh, from here are actually pretty good. You hear a lot of people complain about the Jones Act and these other things, but shipping from here is not terribly egregious, right? There's some people who certain products they ship and they have to go to the mainland first and then they go somewhere else. But most of the products that the small companies in Hawaii are going to ship can go by ocean or certainly can go by air. And um, it gets directly to the market wherever they're going uh, in Asia. Again, as I said earlier in the, in the day, you're not the f first company to do this. It feels like it, but you're not. So ask for advice. Uh, but again, reach out to these companies. It doesn't cost anything to call UPS and call FedEx and meet with one of their account executives, even if you don't have an office. You say, well, I don't, we're such a small company. We don't even have an office to meet. Meet them at Starbucks. You know, It's worth it for you. Even, it's, it's completely worth it. And they love coming to meet new customers. Okay, That's my very brief logistics um, talk. I just want to get some of these uh, ideas in your mind so that you're thinking about it and it, it gets into the pricing of your um, products, OK? Any questions before we move on on just logistics? OK, bear with me. Yes, sir. Did you? Because it's being recorded, I'll tell you after. I'll give you the, the, even the telephone number you can call. Sure. Let's go through um, marketing. We'll do this quickly, but this is the one that I'm obviously most passionate about. Uh, so this is the kind of thing where I could um, go on and on and on about these topics. So I'll keep it short. Let me get this up for the neighbor islands. 
Okay. As I said, I have a day job that's the Insight InterAsia, and then we also have a company, Hawaii Kara, that is focused just on selling things in Japan. But my company is Insight InterAsia, and we, we sell uh, products from the US and Europe all over Asia. Uh, we're headquartered here. It's a, in the history of the company, it's been mostly technology products. Um, and Hawaii Kara is mostly not technology products and products specifically from Hawaii. So I just bring this up. It's not to get you excited about my company. It's just to show you that the only thing I've ever done in my life is sold things in Asia. That's pretty much all I know how to do, um, all I've ever done. Um, my, my undergraduate degree was in petroleum engineering. I never touched a drop of oil in my life that didn't come out of my car. Um, I was immediately hired by a Japanese company to live in Korea, and that sort of started my Asian career, and it kind of never stopped. And I just kept getting transferred and moving around, and I've been based all over Asia um, until I moved here about six years ago. And I still spend most of my time in Asia anyway, running uh, branch offices and, and things there. So um, again, what we do is just basically sell products. Uh, and I, I put this up for you because I don't want you to feel that you're unique. You're out here in the middle of the ocean, but look at the advantages you have. I mean, especially compared to some mainland companies, right? How you can get to any of these markets basically in one flight. Yeah, it's pretty impressive, right? I think a lot of people, I meet a lot of companies here kind of bemoaning the fact that, oh, you know, it's really hard to ship from Hawaii. It's expensive to be based in Hawaii, whatever. Yeah, but okay, you got to throw all of that out and look at the positivity behind it, right? It goes back to building in the aloha, but building in, you know, what, what are your strengths? And your strengths are you can get to Asia so easily and quickly, five, six, seven hour flights. I mean, come on. Where else can you do that? So one of the um, common mistakes, I, I alluded to this earlier, but one of the common mistakes I hear people say is, hey, where would you like to export? Where would you like to export the bamboo bicycles to? Well, we want to export to Asia. I mean, come on. You got to get more specific than that. And Asia is not one giant market. Right, like Europe isn't. But I think you could actually say like Europe is a little more similar. The countries, Japan, let's put it this way. Germany to France is more similar than Japan to Korea, right? Asia is extremely different. And you can't, you can't drive from Japan to Korea, right? If you were going to start up a branch office and say, we're going to attack Europe, OK, you could start up a branch office in Paris or Berlin. You could travel within a couple hours by train or car or um, plane to anywhere in Europe. I mean, it's, it's pretty easy. And you can get by in English. Really, it's true. I've done it many times. But if you're going to start up a branch office in Asia, where do you go, right? A lot of people go to Hong Kong. But then, then what, right? Go to Tokyo. Well, then what? You're, so you wind up having just t lots and lots of branch offices around Asia. You don't have one single office, right? Because you've got cultural sensitivities. You've got language issues. You can't really function in English in Japan, right? You just can't. So that's why I say Asia is not, is, is not one big market. And I would also say from a marketing standpoint that there's this old um, business professor I built a career at IBM. He's famous uh, for this quote, and I, I think it's really true. A company really only does two things. It, it builds something, and then it sells something. And all the other functions that we've talked about are sort of support functions of sales or of manufacturing, right? Accounting, legal, all of that are in support of one of these two functions. So you cannot ignore the marketing part of it. I think it's it, it maybe the most important. So this is where I said before, I stole this slide. Asia's lots of markets, and these are all different. You have to pick one at the beginning. You cannot say, I'm going to ship, or I'm gonna, uh, our business strategy is to sell to Asia. No, 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 no. 
pick one of these markets and then focus particularly on, um, say, Japan, for example. All right, we'll get to how to segment the market a little more carefully. So when you are looking to get into a market, you're going to have to figure out, how do I actually get my product? How do I sell this product? How do I get it out into the market? And so I, I list it here that um, from the, the most expensive options are go direct, meaning you move to Tokyo and you go out and you sell the product. I mean, that's a legitimate, a very legitimate way to do it. It's very expensive. Uh, to do that, and the learning curve is huge, but you have the most control over your destiny should you decide to do that. No question about it, right? Because it's you, you're moving there, or your employee is moving there. Then going down the list, in terms, you could get an agent, you could get a distributor. Everybody understand the difference between an agent and a distributor? A distributor is actually, an agent is more like a salesperson, whereas a distributor is somebody who's buying the product and then actually selling it from their facility out, right? Whereas an agent typically is somebody who's just out selling it, and then you ship it to the customer, and the agent will take sort of a commission, OK? A lot of people don't necessarily understand the difference. Then there's a reseller. See you guys. And a, a, a viable option is if you start looking into exporting, you say, actually, I, I shouldn't be exporting right now. I'm not ready. That's a very viable option to do nothing so that you don't waste a lot of money up here for a few years, right? Get ready to export before you decide, I need an agent or I'm going to move to Tokyo or Bangkok or wherever you're interested in selling the product. This is perhaps the most important. When I said earlier, pick one of these markets, even you say Japan, I'm, I'm unfairly picking on you just because I know what you guys make and sell. They make bamboo bicycles. Is everybody, let's say you, you wanna go to Japan. Is everybody in Japan gonna buy a bamboo bicycle? Is that feasible to even think that way? No, I don't think so. There's First of all, there's only, I don't know, a third of the population actively rides bicycles, right? So right there, you've cut two-thirds out of your potential market. Then who is interested in actually buying a bamboo bicycle, right? Don't take it the wrong way. I'm not trying to focus. Who, who really wants a bamboo bicycle? Not, a th not everybody who rides a bicycle daily in Japan wants a bamboo bicycle, right? There's a certain, you have to look at it like there's a certain level of income that's required to buy a bamboo bicycle. I don't know. There's a certain level of um, interest. Maybe it's a male thing. Maybe it's a female thing. I don't know. But these are the things you have to focus on so that you come up with the recipe of who is your target market segment. And then everything that you do from that point on <coughs> sings to that target market segment, right? Your website is speaking the language of that target market segment. It's not everybody in Japan. It's what, is, what are the, the key words that that target market segment is interested in, right? You gotta think this way. You cannot think, I'm going to sell this to every single 120 million people, person in Japan, the whole population. Right? It doesn't work that way. Right? Very, 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 very few things you can ever think that way. So, so you leave here today thinking, who is really the target market for this? Right? Is it, we, we've, I've worked with um, a company in the past who's selling uh, kind of upscale yoga pants, right? Now, that's not everybody in Japan. You can start to think, okay, who, who is it actually? And then once you, once you start to narrow it down, it's between you know, women between the ages of 27 and 47, in the cities, uh, not out in the country, 
um, with a certain amount of income, a certain amount of education, a certain amount of interest in personal health, and it's these kinds of things. And you can actually narrow it down from 120 million Japanese to about 40,000 potential customers who are actually going to buy the thing, right? And that's the way you've got to think. So that after you define that target market segment, then your messaging is speaking to those people almost like one-to-one -one conversation, right? There's a marketing term called spray and pray where you just sort of say, okay, I'm going to spray everybody with my message and hope something sticks. But if you're actually speaking to the target market segment, you will feel and they will feel like you're having a one-to-one -one conversation with somebody who really you understand each other. Right? And that's your target, that's your goal, so that your, your social media, your website, your pamphlet, your pictures that you take, you can say, oh yeah, that, this is what those people want to see, this is what they want to hear from me, this is what they want to read about my company and my product, right? It won't be generic. Any questions on this? Because I really, this is an extremely key point for the whole day what you need to be working on. Market information is, is plentiful. It's out there. Too much, maybe. But you do need to do your market research before you think about exporting, right? Your export target market segment may not be exactly like your Hawaii target market segment or your mainland target market segment, but they're probably pretty close to the same, right? So this, as we go back to the, um, the yoga pants, um, I mean, these were really like upscale, expensive, form-fitting uh, yoga pants, right? Um, it, it, is it the same in Hawaii as it is in Japan? Is the same target market segment? Probably, we did a bunch of research. We found it was fairly similar, fairly similar, but um, you have to step back and think, okay, in Japan, it's much more of a city life in Tokyo or Osaka or something than it is in Honolulu. And so a lot of the women were wearing the yoga pants on the weekend just as sort of like casual wear around the city. They weren't just, and because it was warm, the pants felt warm to them which was different than the behavior in Hawaii, that they were actually wearing the yoga pants to go do yoga. Okay, so it's just, it's basically the same, but slightly different, all right? And what I say with market research is that there's no clear answer when you're done, when you have enough. You can never, in my opinion, have enough market research or enough data, enough information about the, the market and the target market segment. But there's a point where you have to decide, okay, I have enough where I can proceed. And that's what you need to move ahead with. And you just have to jump in and jump into the market once you have enough information and um, test it out. And there's a lot of ways to test it that we can go over in, in future seminars. There's a lot of ways to test it that don't cost a lot of money. The easiest way in the in a short term is to go to a trade show that's specific to your industry in Japan or whatever your target market is. Go to a trade show with some samples. You don't even have to have a booth. Just walk around and ask people a lot of open-ended questions like, what if I had this thing here and it was available for, you know, $10 or $50 and... Um, what would you, is that a reasonable price for Japan? What would you pay? You know, walk around, see what your competition is doing. Go out, leave the trade show, go visit some stores. See what, how is the product displayed in stores, competitive products or similar products. What does it look like? What does it cost? That sort of thing. Just get some feeling for it. And I mean, what we're talking about is not a tremendous amount of money. Um, for you to spend to go find this information, even on your own. Uh, it's, it's very much worth it. Now, in the modern world, compared to when I say I started my career in sales and marketing, we have all this social media. I mean, 
I feel so old that I, re I remember, you know, having to mail things out and address things and put stamps on them, and that's how we did our marketing, right? Going to trade shows and what have you. But now you have websites and um, Instagram and Facebook and all of these things that um, are different by country. Um, but I think if you're targeting, say, Japan, uh, you can. Um, Instagram is growing a lot and Facebook now owns um, Instagram, so they're, they're easily linked. Twitter is everywhere, but I think for a lot of the products we see coming from Hawaii, Instagram is a great way to do it. And um, we've been consulting companies that if they're very serious about going to Japan, for example, set up a separate account on Instagram that you can post Japanese language um, Instagram posts set up a, a, a separate page uh, um, for Japanese language uh, Facebook posts and what have you. I think that that's extremely helpful. If you're um, really interested in a market, you should um, at least have one page of your website that's dedicated to that language. Um, you know, I, I, I don't recommend at the beginning to, to translate your whole website, but just have a page that explains what your product is all about, what your company is all about. You're a small company, so there's a lot of the, the human behind the product or the service. So explain a little bit about yourself. Um, how did you get into this business? Why are, you, why are you in this business? Explain your passion for the product or the industry that you're in. Just one page. Um, uh, and I think that that goes over extremely well um, in Asia, but particularly in Japan, they, they like to see that. Um, y another thing for your website, you have to, again, envision how your customers are using the website. A lot of people in Japan spend a great deal of time commuting by train and by subway. That's something we don't have here. Well, we may. Uh, <laughs> eventually, but um, we don't have it now. And, and, but you're not going to spend 90 minutes uh, one way commuting here um, unless you're driving. In Japan, it's very common. People on the subways, people on the trains, a lot during a week. And so what are they doing? They're on their mobile phones. What are they looking at? Well, they're shopping, they're playing games, they're chatting, whatever. But my point being that your website needs to be very mobile device friendly, mobile optimized, we call it, okay? So that people can get through your website real quickly and see what's going on. Um, not, you've all been to websites, I'm sure, where you bring it up on your mobile phone, you're like, I don't even know what's going on here. The phone can't handle it. Uh, like, it, there's a lot of flash uh, behind it. You know, you, you can't have flash anymore. It just get rid of it, right? So a very simple website. I like WordPress. WordPress translates to mobile phones very easily. Um, and just get content there that's very easy to digest uh, in, in um, Japanese, for example. Um, another key point I like to make for uh, social media, but just in marketing in general, there's a, after doing this for, honestly, almost 30 years, Taking people from the United States to Japan, working with customers or clients that I represent um, in the US and then I go to Japan, take them to Japan, I'm routinely shocked that Americans think, even in Hawaii, Americans think that Japan is gonna be like Amsterdam. Tokyo's like Amsterdam. You can just show up and speak English. Everybody's gonna understand you. It's gonna work great. You know, but it just doesn't work that way. Even in Tokyo, like, I mean, like the biggest city in the world, you'll be very hard pressed to find somebody that can communicate in English, right? Especially out on the street or what have you. If you go to the hotel and uh, uh, at the front desk, they might speak English, but they were hired and trained and went to school just for that skill, right? The average. Uh, Jane or Joe on the street doesn't speak English, and they're very uncomfortable using it, even if they want to. They're too um, bashful about it or embarrassed. So uh, you just have to understand that if you're going to do business in Japan, you need to find a way to communicate in Japanese. That's all there is to it, 
right? The more you can do that, the more successful you're going to be. I don't mean you have to learn Japanese, but your company, somebody there has to have the ability to communicate in Japanese and direct uh, marketing messages and answer emails and these kinds of things. So it goes back to what I was talking about very early today about why export or why not export. This is one of those topics where if you're not capable, if your company is not capable of handling this type of stuff, then you're not ready to export because these language issues are going to cause you a tremendous amount of trouble. And by trouble, I mean money. It's going to cost a lot of problems uh, by not being able to communicate clearly with them. And you're the seller, so it's your responsibility to make things as easy as possible for the customer to buy from you. And doing part and parcel of that then is doing it in their language. And that's really all there is to it. So I, I spent a little bit too much time on this, but I just see it so routinely. Um, it, it's it's, uh, it's mind boggling to me that it still happens. Korea has their own local um, social media platforms that are powerful. Um, we don't really have that in Japan anymore. There used to be Mixi and some others, but they, they're, they've lost a lot of their market influence. So you can really get by in Japan on the same sort of stuff you get by in the US. China is completely different um, with what you'd want to do in social media there. Um, because it's also regulated, right? They can't access Instagram, they can't access Facebook, they can't access Twitter, they have their own um, things behind the great firewall there that you have to take care of. The other thing that I think, uh, if you're very serious about getting into one of these foreign markets, it's very easy for you to set up a telephone number there and very cheap to the tune of five, six, seven dollars a month. And that phone number would be a virtual number that could ring to you or ring to somebody, but at least has um, a voicemail message in the local language and customers feel like, oh, wow, they're, 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 these guys are actually serious about selling in this market, right? So it's pretty straightforward to set that up through, um, I use a company called Ring Central, but there's tons, right? Um, in fact, we have a Ring Central number in Japan. It works just like a Ring Central number here. I can set it up, or the um, the staff in Japan can set it up so that it, if somebody calls that number, it either rings to their mobile phone, it rings to the office, or it rings to their home phone, or goes to voicemail, or whatever. And it, it's legitimately very reasonably priced to do that. So um, it, it, it's an option I think a lot of companies here could pursue because it's cheap and it works well. I talked about trade shows, but um, again, I can't stress enough how important it is. And the other thing I would add that's important, I see a lot of companies make the mistake here. If they go to the trade show, like let's say the trade show is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That's usually typically three-day trade show. Could be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but what have you. So let's say it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The Hawaiian company will show up there Tuesday night maybe even Monday morning or Wednesday morning, but they get there Tuesday night. They work the trade show Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They try to get to the airport Friday night and get back to Hawaii as quickly as possible. I understand why you want to get home, but it's very important, I think, to get out and see things outside of the trade show. As I said earlier, go to some stores, go to some markets, see how products are displayed, see how they're packaged, see how they're labeled, Touch it, feel it, look around, you know, try to get a flavor for what the market's all about. The market is not that trade show. I mean, there might be buyers and sellers there, but you really need to see what's going on. Get out and, um, you know, if you can, get a translator and, and um, take the translator around for a few hours and have the translator asking questions to store managers and what have you. I mean, you got to get this kind of information, find out how does your product fit in to that market. Also, notify your customers ahead of time. You can find out who some of your customers are in Japan already. Even if you don't have any, you can find out who some of these target markets are. Send them an email, um, even if you have to do it in English. Send them an email and say, hey, I'm coming to this trade show. Um, could I meet you for coffee and get your opinion on the products? Or you know, I'll buy you a beer or something, right? Tell them ahead of time that you're coming. I mean, you'd be surprised how many positive responses you'd get. Um, 
go visit some customers while you're there. Go to their site. You know, beg them to let you come to their site. They might be kind of shy and say, I, I, you know, there's really nothing to see here. We say, no, 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 it's very important. I, I need to see what it is that you, how you operate and how our product could fit into your scheme. And it'll happen. Of course, when you go to these trade shows, you have to be looking at the competition. They're going to be looking at you, so you better be looking at them. The way I suggest you go to one of these trade shows, um, before you get a booth, go to one without a booth because it's easier to move around and um, look at competitors. Because once you have a booth and your name is on the, the master list and what you sell and whatever, then of course the, all the competitors are going to come over and check you out too. So if you go in first, the first year that you're looking, you can be a little more stealthy. Hey, it's business. You got to do it. I talked about this earlier, but I'm, I'm just going to beat it um, to death one more time. You're, we are all so fortunate to be here and have Hawaii marketing on our behalf all of the time, the words Hawaii and aloha and things like this. Use it to your extreme advantage, right? Made in, uh, made on Oahu with aloha or you know, these types of things. As much as you can build that into your product and build it into your messaging, the more successful you're going to be. I can't stress that enough. And I go, I, again, it, just think about it for some time when you're out of this course. Think about that Transylvania example and just think, wow, you know, those, there's people in Transylvania trying to export something today, right? Of course, everybody's thinking, oh, what are you going to export? Blood? What are you going to export out of Transylvania, right? You don't think about that when you hear Hawaii. You think about what? Sunshine. All good things, right? So keep that in your mind. The other thing, um, Naomi Masuno from the Bank of Hawaii, she talked about this early. If you're going to start to export, you have to start keeping an eye on the foreign exchange rates. Okay? So let's just talk about it briefly from, say, five years ago, 10 years ago to now. Let's go back 20 more, 30 years ago. <coughs> Most of my adult life and my career, when living in Japan or what have you, working for Japanese companies, Tokyo, Japan itself, but let's say Tokyo, was egregiously expensive from an American standpoint, meaning you take US dollars and you convert it to Japanese yen and you thought, oh my god, you know, it's, it's like $15 for a beer, or, you know, just crazy kind of things. But now, reverse that, because that's really what's happened in the past, I don't know, five years or so. That if you think back 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, Japanese tourists coming to Hawaii thought, oh my god, it's dirt cheap here. My, this is like monopoly money, and they're just throwing money around. They you know, go to Costco and buy a, extra suitcases so they can just fill it up with stuff and take it back. That doesn't exist anymore, because the, the exchange rates have flipped. So if you will, go back to the beginning of my career. I remember at one point there were 78 yen per one US dollar when I was like 21 years old. And now it sort of fluctuates, but let's say it's 115. It, you know, not long ago, I think it got as high as 122. So that means one dollar, you take it to Japan, they'll give you 78 yen a long time ago. Now you take it to Japan, they give you 122 yen. Right? So you can, your money seems to go a lot farther. So the first time in my adult life, Japan is not crazy expensive. In fact, some things are like really reasonably priced, right? Especially you go out for food, you go to um, a decent, like a cheap sushi restaurant or a ramen shop. It's like, oh my God, this is so cheap. How can we not do this in Hawaii? But it, it's, it's relative to the exchange rate, right? So the same has happened for Japanese who want to buy products from Hawaii, where it used to be feel dirt cheap, now it actually feels kind of expensive, right? It used to be a cheap vacation for them to come to Hawaii. Now it's kind of an expensive vacation, right? So what you have to do is position yourself accordingly. And I, I really feel that the, of the companies that I meet in Hawaii, the ones that I, I really feel have the best potential recipe for success are the ones that are sort of positioned as 
a premier product or a premium version of what their industry is all about, right? If you're just kind of an also ran, like I make, I make soap. My soap competes with Dove and um, Irish Spring and whatever. You're not going to, you're just not going to do very well in uh, trying to sell in an international market, especially when the currency is a little weighted towards one side, right? But where you could do really well is selling soap that's, you know, first of all, it's made in Hawaii with aloha from natural ingredients. And let's say a bar of Irish Spring costs a dollar. Your soap costs six dollars or ten dollars or something, but you can explain why it costs ten dollars, right? That's baked into your whole marketing scheme. Those are the companies I see doing really, really well here, right? Not just the, I don't know, I make soap. Okay, that doesn't mean anything, right? But I make this soap from natural ingredients made in, on the Big Island. Um, We've got lots of aloha into it, and there's natural ingredients and, and scents and things like that that can only be found in Hawaii. Oh, man, the people be tripping over each other to buy that stuff at $10 a bar, right? Again, not everybody. You're not going to sell 120 million bars in Japan to every single citizen of Japan, but there's probably 100,000 people who will spend ten dollars for a bar of soap with all of that baked in aloha that's how you have to think right you got to target that type of activity right and that's where i really see that these kind of I, for lack of a better word i'm just calling them the premium suppliers but when i say premium i really mean that aloha baked into it and those are the people that i see doing really 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 well Right? Whether it's jewelry manufacturers or soap manufacturers or candles or cookies or whatever, they're just great. Okay, keep that in mind, please. We talked about this a little earlier, so I'm not going to go over it. And Naomi talked about it in the finance presentation. But pricing, you've got to keep an eye on that, obviously. Um, know what's going on. How do the foreign exchange rates affect your pricing? We've talked about Japan, but there's other markets for sure. Korean yuan and the Chinese yuan, or sometimes I call it renminbi. Um, Indian rupees or the euro. All of these things, you have to keep an eye on it because it affects how your product is positioned in the market. As I said earlier, you know, even 10 years ago, how your position in the Japanese market could be really different than how you're positioned now, right? You could have been maybe a cheap supplier at some point 10 years ago or so, but now it's much more difficult because it's, you have to look at it as just cheap from their point of view, right? Um, let me talk about price quotes and terms. Earlier we talked about INCO terms, if you remember, that's really in logistics. Price terms or um, terms that might be in your quote would be, it's very common in the US, you get 210 net 30. Anybody ever dealt with that before? That term means what? You get, if you pay within 10 days, you get a 2% discount, otherwise it's net 30. You owe the money within net 30, right? Those are sort of common terms in the United States. There's lots of other net 45. Depends on your industry. It could be even net 90 or whatever. But know the local terms. Don't just show up in Japan and say, hey, uh, our terms are 210 net 30. Deal with that or don't buy from us. You know, Get to know what, what are the local terms there. Um, it, it depends a lot by industry and what have you. Um, the other thing I think uh, a lot of um, US suppliers that I've met uh, are surprise when they're asked for staggered payment scheme, meaning let's say a customer orders from you, again, a Japanese customer orders from you $10,000 worth of your product. They say, okay, we'll pay you 40% up front. We'll pay you 40% when the product arrives in Japan and then we'll pay you the final 10% or 20% or whatever after we've tested it and it works and it does what you say it's gonna do. 
Now you might look at that and say, oh my God, it sounds so complicated. But for them, that's actually a pretty standard way of doing it, right? So you, you're, not, you're not forced to accept that. Maybe that's just the starting point for a negotiation. But don't be surprised when that sort of request uh, comes about, right? It's pretty common. We talked about shipping. The reason I bring it up again is if this was a separate presentation from the logistics one, you've got to bake in your shipping and all of those logistics costs into your pricing well ahead of time. Don't wait until the 11th hour and 59th minute to figure out what does it cost to ship the product. And by shipping the product, again, it's the taxes, it's the insurance, the whole thing, right? Work with somebody to figure out what does it actually cost to get this product from here into my customer's hands. Now, some of you might have products um, that require what in Asia would be called after sales service, meaning does it need repair, does it need spare parts, does it need maintenance, does it need whatever. You need to think about that because this is a very, very, very big deal in Japan, Korea, um, East Asia, I would say they really think about this well ahead of time. So they're, they're going to ask you, you know, where do we keep spare parts? Where do you stock spare parts? Where, do, where you guys would have spares? Like, where are they? How long would it take me to get spares? If I just need one little widget, are you gonna FedEx it from Hawaii? And what is that gonna cost? And how long is that gonna take? And what have you, right? So you, Think about these things well in advance, not until you're actually doing a sales presentation or what have you. Because they're going to ask you, so you better be able to answer it quickly and cleanly. Um, we've talked about this, so I, I'll, I'll get over it. Um, but this is just Japan-specific information. So I, I set up a little homework here. Define your product in 25 words. You've got to be able to do that, even less if you can. Determine your key market segment and define that segment in 25 words. Remember, as I said, you're not going to sell these to 120 million Japanese people. Figure out really what is the size of that market and who are they? What kind of magazines do they read? What do they do as a hobby? How much money do they make? Where did they go to school? What kind of education do they have? What are the common denominators, right? Determine that market in 25 words or less. Then figure out what's your sales strategy, your marketing strategy in that regard. How, how are you going to get the product displayed, uh, showing it off to people in Japan? You're going to have an agent. You find a distributor, you do it yourself, what? Figure that out. It's, it's extremely important. Build a website or at least a page, some, a couple paragraphs in the target market language. You know, I, I've even recommended to people, uh, say, Australia or Singapore, Hong Kong, they use British English. I've recommended to people, just take your, English, your American website and Britishize it, Anglicize it. They appreciate it, you know. They really do. They think that American spelling and American culture sort of ram down their throat on a daily basis, right? So if you take out a few Zs and put in a few Ss and it makes them happy, right? Why not? Do it. It's your customer. Um, I, think it's, I think it's important. Um, again, I don't know if we talked about this earlier today. I don't think so, but I see this problem a lot. Let's say it, it's, not a, it's not a problem per se until you are getting serious about the business and you're getting serious about thinking about exporting, right? If you're selling a product and your primary email address is like wangdangdoodle at yahoo.com, I mean, how seriously do you expect to be taken when you're going to Japan and going to a trade show and whatever, right? I mean, it depends on what, what, what are you selling, 
you know, let's say this, say you're doing art, you say rainbow paintings from Hawaii at gmail.com. I mean, if that's your main address, people are going to tend to treat you like that you're the person behind a kind of a nondescript uh, email like that. And so I think very easily and cheaply just get a domain name for your company and then use Google Apps or one of those services and just get a real email address for five bucks a month at, um, you know, let's, let's say the name of your company is Wang Dang Doodle, then get wangdangdoodle.com and then use aloha at wangdangdoodle.com as your main email address, right? I think you just gotta start doing that. And then when you get really serious, you set up a, another alias address or a separate account that's japan at wangdangdoodle.com. And then that Japan email address, people can communicate in Japanese. They know, oh, it's Japan at whatever. I can communicate in Japanese with this address, right? But you, you got to have somebody that can answer that email in Japanese too, right? But I, I see this all the time. I just feel like from a marketing standpoint, you really want to convey to the customer and your suppliers and whatever, that you're a real going concern. You're a real company with something behind it, right? If you're just, you know, Fred Dingle Frizzle at, at um, AOL, that, that one drives me nuts, AOL.com. People are just, they don't get the feeling like, oh, wow, they, these guys are, they're a company, they're gonna be around for a while, I can count on seeing them next year at this trade show or what have you, right? So again, I, I'm sort of belaboring the point, but I think it's very meaningful because you really gotta start thinking in this direction. I talked about the A4 paper before, but I, I, I'll beat that one dead again. It's extremely important, this kind of thing. If you're gonna to go to a trade show in Japan, you're gonna spend a few hundred bucks making some nice flyers and whatever, and all the customer is gonna do is look at it and throw it away. What's the point, right? Get it on A4 paper. But also, get used to the fact that um, you're going to, if you're gonna export or you're gonna deal with foreign companies, foreign people, you're going to have to get used to doing things on a metric system, understanding what that is. Don't put your product dimensions on your Japanese pamphlets in inches and pounds and stuff like that because they don't even, they don't really know what it means. And by putting it there, they look at you and it, it emphasizes your foreignness or your ignorance of the market, right? So again, as marketers, salespeople, our job is what? To make it as easy as possible for the customers to buy from us. So do that, right? Think about it. Um, I also suggest uh, sending some emails, developing a database and sending out email newsletters, right? You should do that in English anyway with your customers locally, but um, get some help, get a professional translator and develop um, uh, a Japanese or a Korean or a Brazilian Portuguese or whatever is your target market, develop a newsletter in that language and send it out. And that's a great way to keep in touch with your, with your clients. Don't send it to everybody. Again, it goes back to that target market segment. If your target market segment is defined well enough, they are gonna, at worst, save your email to read later. But at the best case, they're gonna say, oh, this is, the, oh yeah, this is the um, Bamboo Bicycle Company. That, the, these guys, I'm gonna take a second and read this email from them and then click on it, right? Because you're, you're in tune with them, right? If you send it to just, I don't know, some, somebody in Japan who has no interest whatsoever in riding bicycles, then oh yeah, click spam, right? That's not what you want. But if you're singing the same, from the same sheet of music as that target market segment, those newsletters are great. You get them, you get email, you get newsletters you think are important and you get newsletters you think are terrible. Everybody gets it, right? The goal is to get yourself into the point where you're looking at newsletters that, you're sending newsletters that people are thinking, oh yeah, that's cool. Okay, then they delete it, but at least they read it, right? That's where we need to be. So when I say, take this little recipe and adjust it and repeat it for a year, 
But I thoroughly believe you'll have infinitely more market knowledge about your target market than you have today. If you do this for a year, for one year from now, you will have not spent very much money, but you will know so much more about that target market than you do now if you just follow this little recipe. Okay. Any questions on marketing? Please. Uh, when you're saying send the bilingual emails out, especially for mass marketing, does Japan have the equivalent to can spam laws that we need to be aware of? Um, yeah, that's a good question. You, in Japan, I would say that it's roughly equivalent to what it is here. And I think you'll be fine. Um, I do it all the time. And I consult the people who do it all the time. And they have, as I said, if you're singing to that target market, you're more than fine, right? They like getting that information. But if you're not, they'll click spam just like anybody else will click spam. But the laws are OK. Sorry about that. I still have a presentation on e-commerce, but I'll save that for you. And we have, I'll email it to you if anybody wants it. Um, and the reason that we don't need to rush through it is because we're having a very specific one coming up on March 8th, just on e-commerce. It'll be much more detailed than I would go through now anyway. Um, May, let me remind you that in May, we have uh, international trade shows where we're going to be covering what to do at a trade show. But more importantly, I believe, what to do before you go to the trade show to get ready for it. And probably most importantly, what you do after the trade show to follow up and convert what you did at the trade show into dollars. Okay, and some of that is, is um, technology oriented, but some of it's a little bit common sense that people just forget. Okay, so we'll go over that and it'll have a Japan flavor too because I think we'll talk about how to stand and pass out business cards at a Japanese trade show and things like that. Um, pretty basic stuff, but I think it's important to understand. You know, from Hawaii, we tend to be a huggy crowd uh, and hug people and slap them on the back and all of that stuff, but in Japan, you, you could probably have a relative uh, for years that you've never hugged. Right? They, it just doesn't happen. Um, similarly, I think we're a little too casual with the way we pass out business cards here. In fact, a lot of times you don't even get one from somebody you meet. Or when you do get one, it could be like they're flinging uh, cars at a blackjack table or something. right? Whereas in Japan, Korea, these things are its quite a bit more formalized. And so I, I, I want to cover that and make sure we we go into this, so when you go to a trade show, you look like you belong there. Okay, and then there's some things about posture and common sense stuff about what to do at a, at a Japanese trade show. How to work with translators. It's a, that's a very good seminar, so I highly encourage you to do that. And it, we try to schedule those trade show seminars so that they're right before like the uh, um, Tokyo International Gift Show Hong Q Festival, things like that. That's a very good show. Um, doesn't really get publicized in Hawaii, but I recommend that you look into it. Um, DBET's trying to do more with them through the High Step program. It's this Hong Q, H A N K Y U Festival. It's a Hawaii themed festival at this enormous department store in Osaka where um, you have buyers coming who are inherently just interested in Hawaii products, right? So you, it's really like um, uh, throwing a fishing line into a, a bucket of hungry fish. I mean, they're just there ready for you to reel them in, and it's great. 
it's just a great opportunity. Um, so please have a look at that. And just go to that trade show. If, you know, if you're looking for market information, you can't do better than two or three days at that um, Tokyo, I mean the Hankyu Festival. And then there's, there's agricultural specific shows. Japan is, um, is a, a, a powerhouse in trade shows in general. So no matter what your industry is or what your product niche is, you will find a big trade show, international trade show in Tokyo, most likely, possibly Osaka, but most likely Tokyo. Tokyo, uh, Tokyo International Gift Show is one but there's many others that are very specific to what your industry might be, whether it's food or um, personal care products, which there's a lot of from Hawaii, um, drinks, uh, whatever. Just take a look at the, um, at the uh, Tokyo Big Site website. They have an English website, and it'll show you all of the um, trade shows that are there for, for that uh, year. And they're well planned and advanced, and you can plan accordingly to attend for a few days and see what's going on there. Most of them are free to get into, you just have to register. And it's very much worth it. Okay, one other quick thing before we depart, because I, I didn't really get to the, the government um, side of what's the support. You met the DBET people. Um, please follow up with them. We're not government, we're private sector, uh, but we're. Uh, it, the Hawaii Pacific Export Council is a nonprofit that's here to help you, so please um, contact us with anything. This is a tremendous book that's put out by the U.S. Commercial Service that more conveniently than this, you can get the exact same thing online in PDF form at export.gov. It's called the Basic Guide to Exporting, and it covers um, just Lots and lots of information that I think somebody interested in exporting could glean a lot of information out of there. And then while you're on that site, you can look at different country-specific um, publications that they have. And it's all free. You don't have to do anything. I don't even think you have to register to get this. Okay. I'll have a, I, I have to keep these, but if you're interested to come by and look at it and see what it looks like, please come up and have a look before we depart. Um, any final questions before we leave? I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I hope you learned something. Remember, the goal of this was to just give you some things to think about and uh, go home and really think about, are we ready to export? Are we, what do we need to learn? What do we need to focus more on during the next months or years or what have you? And then come back for more of our seminars that are much more in-depth. This is just a reminder, these are very broad strokes, but any one of these topics we could talk about for half a day easily, right? So we have the experts here to answer questions specifically that you might develop. So please keep in touch with us. Okay? Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you.